Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the What's in My Head podcast. I'm your host, Julian, and today I'm joined by the man, the myth, the legend himself. The mechanic is what he called himself just a minute ago, Mr. Robert Alvarez. Robert, how are you, my friend? I'm doing well. Well, I'll, I'll give you the answer that Catherine Hepburn used to say. Um, I'm doing fine as long as you don't ask for details. <laughs> That's outstanding. So when I started to ask all these questions and I showed you these fans questions before, we got six pages of fan questions, but the number one thing I wanted to get to is what you told me to remind you. And you told me to remind you a story about Rudy Zamora and Bill Hanna, the uh, time card story. So I figured we'll open up with those two stories. Well, the Rudy Zamora story is kind of interesting. Uh, some of the people out there, especially if they're young and if they really don't know, if they're not up on animation history, they probably don't have any idea who the hell Rudy Zamora was. But he was a, was a very talented animator, started out in the 1930s. And I'm pretty sure Zamora worked up until the probably the 1980s. I, I don't know when he passed away. But when he was working for Disney in the 30s, he was animating. Disney in those days would sometimes take um, a group of uh, artists to some of the previews and they would go to some out of the, out of the way place where uh, some theater where the films were being previewed and they I don't know which film they were previewing it was probably a short or something and uh, afterwards they're out in front of the theater and Walt is trying to get feedback from the other artists and the artists are there and saying like what do you think what do you think and he turns to Rudy and he goes Rudy what do you think and and Rudy said Walt I have one question and Walt goes what he goes how do you make them move which I thought was a funny thing to, for him to say. No, he knew, I mean, it was kind of silly, but I, it, that was probably his type of sense of humor. The other story, which I, I, I like to tell this to people when I, can't, when I think of it, is the Bill Hanna story. Most people don't know what Bill Hanna was really like. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in his later years, he, he had Alzheimer's, and as he was slowly progressing into the disease, he became the opposite of Bill Hanna became this really nice, pleasant man, mm -hmm. which is kind of not typical of Alzheimer's people because most of the time they have the tendency to be really freaky and uh, it's, it's a very dreadful disease. My mother passed away from it and it's not pleasant, but he turned into this really nice, pleasant man. But prior to that, when he was his original Bill Hanna, this was at uh, the 3400 building on Coenga, the, the last building that Hanna Barbera was at, and um, editing used to at that time was down in the basement of the building, and he was walking by one of the editing rooms, and there was this editor who didn't see him in the doorway, and he's sitting at his desk. He's got his feet up on the table, and he's looking at his time time card, and he's he's thinking out loud. He's saying, "What should I put on my time card?" And Bill Hanna is sit, standing in the door. He goes, why don't you put 40 hours of fucking off? <laughs> and that was, that was Bill Hanna. He was really, he was rough. He could be really tough. And he uh, was an interesting character. I, I had several meetings where I was in with Bill Hanna. And I also worked with him closely on the Jetson feature. Mm -hmm. By then, on the Jetson feature, he was already turning into this nice old guy. But he was really crusty. Yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine, man. Uh, thank you for sharing those two stories. Um, and uh, your friend, Chris Battle. And then, it, ladies and gentlemen, if you do not know who this man is, first off, shame on you. Mr. Robert Alvarez has been on some of, I've written down a small snippet of your resume. We're just going to rattle some of these off. Smurfs, we just talked about the Jetsons feature length film. You're on G.I. Joe, Ninja Turtles, SWAT Cats, Animaniacs, Dexter's Lab, Powerpuff Girls, Samurai Jack, the regular show, Ben 10, Adventure Time. And this is just a small glimpse into what this man has helped accomplish. You know, he did not create these characters, but he helped make sure that these characters are just as relevant as the people that created these characters, man. And without that, we don't have the longevity of these things that came out of the what a cartoon and the cartoon cartoon era. The gold, in my opinion, excuse me, uh, the renaissance right here is when those cartoons started happening. That early 90s, well, mid 90s to late, 2000s is when my probably the hot and heaviest that I was into cartoons joined the Navy in 2009 so I kind of lost touch with these and then I picked it back up with the regular show fantastic cartoon as well um, but taking a step back um, and reading what Chris Battle said he wanted me to bring up 
And I think you've mentioned this a few times on, uh, on, on one of the two stories, whenever you've shared a Hanna-Barbera cell. One of my favorite things about following you on, on Facebook is seeing the beautiful cells that you go up and put up. And some of the ones, as a little kid, you went and retrieved from Hanna-Barbera because back then they would just throw everything away. I think you said with the exception of Walt Disney, every right. other studio pretty much threw this stuff away because they just had no space for it, right? It's so Chris wanted me to ask you, uh, see if he'll talk about the time uh, Bill Hanna came out with a five iron and chased you and your friends away from the dumpster when you guys are trying to get the cells. <laughs> well, I don't, I don't recall a five iron, but here's what happened. See, let me do this a little backtrack. Mm -hmm. uh, I met my friend Tim Walker in, in the seventh grade at St. Charles School in North Hollywood. And Tim happened to know where Hanna-Barbera was. And he had a neighbor, his next door neighbor was a, a, a VP at ABC. And he got him some cells from the very first season of Flintstones. And I remember in those days, you should still do show and tell. And he brought him to school. And I went, wow, you know, it's like, this was great. I had to find out more about this stuff. So uh, Tim and I would ride our bikes a lot after school over to Hanna-Barbera. And the, and this was before they moved into the last one we went out. They were in a smaller location down the street from 3400 Coenga. And uh, they had a dumpster in the back and it was a small parking lot. And uh, you could just walk right up to it. And we would go there all the time. And we'd bring, we had these army backpacks and we would just stuff them with cells, get on our bikes and ride back to Tim's house. One day we were there and uh, the, the reason for them chasing us away was, was I could see their point of view because stuff would fly out and, and the wind would come through that little parking lot and the stuff would be all over the hillside and back and it was a mess. And Bill and Joe must've been coming back, uh, back from lunch or something <laughs> and they see us and they go, hey, you kids, get out of it. You know, they start yelling at us. Oh, we just jump out, get on our bikes right away. They could never catch us. But here's the really funny thing about that. Years later, I'm working with Bill Hanna. And I'm, this is when we were doing the Jetson feature. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had called me up personally on the phone. I was working at home. And he said, uh, oh, would you mind uh, helping me out on the Jetson feature? And, and I, you know, that was like a not a request. It was a command because I was already on staff. So I, yeah, sure. We're walking up the stairs. He had a, he had an office on the top of 34 in the It was like the penthouse suite and mm -hmm. it was fantastic. So we're walking up the stairs to go to his office. And I said to him, Hey, Mr. Han, I just want to tell you, um, I was one of those kids that used to chase away from the dumpster in back of the, uh, the old studio. And he, he, he said, Oh, well, we were always afraid that your kids would fall in and get stuck inside, which is total bullshit because they didn't care about that. They just wanted to keep us out. They wanted to keep us out so much that eventually they put a, a uh, they had like this iron bar across the, the dumpster with a padlock on it. So whenever they were, you know, not throwing stuff in, it was locked up. Well, that didn't stop us because then we got a rock, a big rock from the hillside and start pushing it in and bent the, the you know, the, the one side so we could reach in with our arms and pull stuff out. And then my friend, Tim, one day after school, he rides, his, he goes by himself to Hanna-Barbera and the lock was off the, the bar and the bar was off the dumpster. He rode home with the bar so that they couldn't <laughs> lock it up. And for years that was in his backyard. Oh, Fun that's, times. That's an awesome story, man. Thank you for sharing that. And Chris, thank you for uh, writing that one. I really, really appreciate that. Uh, you said something I want to circle back to. Uh, you said your friend Tim would bring show and tell, and that's when you saw him. Yeah. Was that the initial spark, I guess, that you felt like, oh, man, this this might be a, a career path for me? No, I don't know. It's hard to remember because we're, we're talking like 100 years ago now. So uh, <laughs> uh, I always, from an earliest age, even when I lived, originally I'm from New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, even back then, I would watch cartoons on, on TV, and uh, it was I liked them, like every kid did. And I liked comic books, because I was reading comic books and watching cartoons. And by the time I saw Tim, I already had this great interest in, in, in animation mm -hmm. and comic books and comic strips and all that. And it just, when, when, I, when we started going to ride our bikes to uh, Hanna-Barbera, UPA, and Format Films to see what we could pull out of the trash. It just generated the interest. And uh, we started making our own cartoons on our own. And it was in eighth grade, 
pretty much, I think, when I decided I wanted to be an animator someday. I didn't know how that was going to happen, but that's when I decided. So, yeah, from an early age, I had this interest, and uh, that's when I decided I wanted to be an animator. Uh, one quick story. I, when I went, to, I went to Catholic school almost all of, like grade school and high school, which I don't re recommend because, well, it's different now, but it was, it was super strict in the 1950s and 60s when I went to school. And uh, one, they used to line you up before you would go into class in grade school. And, um, you know, it was small to, to, to tall and boys on one side, girls, and you'd march in and you'd march out at the end of the day. So we're standing in line waiting to go in the morning and I'm talking to some kid about some cartoon that I had seen on television. And the kid behind me says, you still watch cartoons? Now this is like probably 1961. Yeah. And uh, I'm in seventh grade and, I, and I, I turned to him and I snapped at him really quickly and it kind of pissed me off. And I said, yeah, and someday I'm gonna be an animator. I had no idea how that would ever happen, but he just, he got me angry. And I wish I could remember that who that was so I could find him now and go, there you go. <laughs> F you. <laughs> Beautiful, man. You always need some kind of adversity in your life to really propel or push you forward. Everybody, especially with me, I get, I don't want to say I get off because that's a little dirty. I like it when somebody tells me I can't do something because then I have more motivation to go and say, hey, I did it. And I did it because of spite you. So thank you in a sense, but haha, fuck you. I win at the end of the day because I got to do what I wanted to do. And I really like hearing that that's still a thing uh, that, that people really strive on. Um, but taking a step back, when you when you tell your mom or when you figure that that initial um, that initial career path for you is going to be an animator and you, that's what you want to do around eighth grade is what you said. Um, and you do you tell your parents at that point were they very very you know were they helpful were they pushing you towards it or did they try to t talk you out of it? Well, yeah, they were helpful in the sense that when I eventually went to art school, yeah, I mean my my parents paid for my tuition to go to 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 the old Schnard Art School, but. Early on, they were helpful from the standpoint that my dad, in fact, I've got it right over here, uh, let me start using his old eight millimeter camera. I'll pull it over. Uh, I have it on the shelf here. And see this thing? Oh, yeah. This is an old eight millimeter camera. And I used to make home movies that were live action. Usually they were science fiction type things. And I started using this to do animation. But it doesn't have a single frame advance. So you just you press the shutter. Sometimes you get two frames. If you were lucky, you got one, whatever. It and I started making cartoons and some of it was tabletop animation. Some of it was cell animation. You know, it was all, looking back, it's all terrible stuff. But <laughs> I, had an, I had an interest in making film and uh, they were supportive of that and that, that they would let me use the ca my, my dad's camera and they, they bought me some film and obviously would pay for developing and all that stuff. And then when I wanted to go to art school, they yeah they were they, they said okay uh, at first my dad was not too happy about only about the school because his his company was literally several blocks away from the ocean art school and now this was 19 uh 68 as one 67 is when i started in art school and in those days you know it's like everybody was starting to get long hair and all that stuff and he didn't like that idea. He thought if I went to that school, I was going to turn into whatever he his worst nightmare was. Mm -hmm. But they said, OK, they paid my way. And so they were supportive. And um, I think once I finally made it and was working in the business, I think they really liked it and were appreciative of what I had accomplished. But they never sat down and told me, uh, wow, we're really proud of you. And we think this is what, really great what, what you've done. Yeah. I never heard it from them, and which I wish I had because they're long gone now. But uh, uh, hopefully they, wherever they might be, they might be looking down and thinking like, oh, well, he, he really did something good. I got to imagine. And before I, I, I say what I'm about to say, uh, I hate asking this question because it's always a sensitive subject. Did they get to see your your short pizza boy big tip or no tip, excuse me? No, unfortunately, my dad passed away in 2002. So that was about three years before that. Okay. And my mom, this is kind of a sad story. I hope, sorry, audience, bringing you down here a little bit, but, uh, you know, hold on to your seats. Um, my mom uh, was already had the early stages of, of Alzheimer's before my dad passed away. And by the t after he passed away, she declined 
rather quickly. Yeah. And when I won my first Emmy for Samurai Jack, that night I won an Emmy for Samurai Jack and Star Wars Clone Wars the same night. I brought them to my mom's house to show her. And I don't think she had a clue as to what I was showing. They were just shiny objects to her. And unfortunately, so they never got to see any of that success. And uh, they never saw, obviously my mom didn't see those shorts. Even if she saw it, she wouldn't have been able to understand it. So that's too bad, but you know, it is what it is. I got to imagine, regardless of your parents grew up during the Great Depression, I would imagine, correct? Yeah. So it was a different breed because I had some great grandparents. They were very, very uh, selfish. Isn't the, I can't think of the right word. They were very, no emotion whatsoever. Uh, very rarely did they ever give me a hug. Uh, very rarely did they ever tell me they loved me. And I, I, they died when I was maybe six or seven. So I don't really remember too much, but I remember them being very, very cold, right? Um, not really asking you, you know, what you were into or anything like that. But I got to imagine that your dad saw you wanting to be an animator. Same thing with your mom. And then you went to art school and then you kept with it. It's not something you gave up on. It's something you kept pursuing. You kept your head down and you just kept going from cartoon to cartoon, creator to creator, all this other stuff, just building your repertoire, building and honing your craft. So I got to imagine, even if they did not say that they were proud of you, I got to imagine that deep down inside that they were proud of you because that's one thing I try to do on a consistent basis with my son because I have an 11 year old now and it is very difficult for me I didn't have a dad growing up he wasn't in the picture at all he was more worried about or he was more interested in women um, that wasn't my mom and drugs and he went to prison when I was real young so he I didn't have the the standard like go and play catch and all that other shit that you know a lot of kids do um, you know but I got to imagine his own way that he might've been proud no matter what I did. And I talk to him now off and on. Um, he's going through some tough shit right now. Um, but the whole reason I bring up that story is because now I wanna make sure that, that my son knows every time he does something that, that I'm proud of him, that I love him, no matter what he chooses to do or what he doesn't choose to do, as long as he keeps his nose clean, he goes to school on time when he's supposed to, he gets good grades, he tries as hard as he possibly can, dad's always gonna be happy. And I gotta imagine that that's, you know, that that's the same kind of mindset your parents had, even though if they didn't tell you, they, they, they were really proud of you, man. So I got to imagine that. Um, and you brought up something that I really, really want to talk about. And that's Samurai Jack. But I want to get to, you know, where Robert started at, man. So you said you went to art school. I cannot pronounce that name. I've heard but it. It's, oh, Chenard. Chenard. I was I was I Googled it and YouTubed it on how to pronounce the pronunciation of that one. So it always it said it real weird. And then I've heard other people say it. So I didn't really know the actual Yes, some, sometimes you hear people mispronounce it in the case Schoenard, but yeah. it was Schoenard. And uh, it was, uh, uh, this lady had started, I think, in the 19, probably in the 1930s or even the late 20s or something like that. And but Disney eventually got connected to it in the sense that a lot of his artists had either come out of that school or he, he, he hired Don Graham, who was an art instructor at the school, to teach uh, life drawing and, uh, to uh, to the artists and uh, it was supported by Disney. Uh, I think the, the present school now is California Institute of the Arts and it's right, I live right below it mm -hmm. in, in, in Santa Clarita. And uh, Disney has supported that school over the years. And I have a feeling that they, they bought that, they gave the school that property before it was built. And uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a great, when I went to it, it was the old school downtown. Uh, some of your, audience might have heard of MacArthur's Park in downtown Los Angeles. And it used to be right across the street from MacArthur's Park on 7th Street. And it was in several different buildings. And it was the main old Chouinard building mm -hmm. that you would have a lot of your classes in. And it was fun times. And uh, I enjoyed it. I wish I had taken it a little bit more seriously, but um, it was good. I'm glad I got, I'm glad I, I, I it all turned out good for me. Oh, I, good is a, an understatement and a very, very humble way of saying it turned out gangbusters. You know, for me, look at on the outside looking in, man, like I guess when I look at your resume, it's an out, it's, it's an extensive resume when you really break it down. I, I don't know how you sleep, let alone get to do all of these shows. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, but what were some of the big things that you think you took away from school? I know you said that, that you wish you would have took a little bit more serious, but I could imagine you took some stuff from the school. Well, uh, some of the teachers that I had were really excellent. 
un unfortunately, only one of them I think is still alive, Bob Kurtz. Mm -hmm. I had a class with Bob Kurtz on it was a night class and he was very good because he made you think. He gave you assignments where you had to really think and he was really stressed the importance of you doing them and, and uh, critiquing them and all that. But I had teachers there that were really good and some of them were, you could tell, were just coming through to pick up a paycheck and weren't really, they didn't care. Mm -hmm. uh, but Bill Hertz was one of my teachers and he, he was a, at that time a director at, at Jay Ward. Yeah. And he was great. He was great. Um, Zach Schwartz was one, was, I had a teacher as, uh, for a teacher in the first year and he was one of the co-founders of UPA. Mm -hmm. And he was, he, was, he was good. He gave us good assignments. You know, there was some downside to it. Some of the teachers that had nothing to do with film or animation were uh, a giant pain in the ass. I can think of one. Anyone who went to Chenard, when I went to Chenard, will tell you stories about Bill Moore, a design teacher. He was a real prick. And uh, I had, they decided when we, when I got there that people that were in animation have, should have more design classes. So I had them three semesters in a row, which was torture. Most mm -hmm. people only have them once. I had them three times in a row and it was just, agonizing but then the other thing that was good about the school was the friends yeah. because i when i went to the school what was really funny the very first day on the very first semester i was there you know, showing up for registration and boom what was unusual was there were so many students that came from my high school mm -hmm. and uh and i went wow you're here you're here and uh but, but when i was there I, that's where i met mark Kausler. And Mark Kalzer is he's retired now, but he is a fantastic animator. And I got to work with him later on in, at Hanna-Barbera. And my friend Tim Walker, who I'd known since seventh grade, was there. And um, Dale Bear, who just passed away the, earlier this year, he was there. And um, there was another, a couple other people that I occasionally worked with years later. So it was, you know, it was a good experience friendships were, were good and uh i'm glad i went but i'll be honest with you when it comes to what i learned really i learned it all on the job yeah once i got that first job i mean i had a basic understanding of of animation but once i got the first job and i learned what you really had to do for tv animation it was a learning process there that wasn't that hard to pick up mm -hmm. but i learned it on the job art school was a place for you to experiment and 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 do different things and assignments and all that and have fun. But um, I, I think I really learned what I know working in the industry. Oh, 100%, man. Uh, I, I'm in the creative field as well. During the day, I, you know, I go and cook at a restaurant for, for a living. That's how I make, my, that's how I make my, my bills and everything like that. And it's the same concept, especially with, with today's day and age where everything's on YouTube. You can watch anything on TV. You can learn so much and you don't even have to leave your house. When I went to culinary school, I'd wanted to be a chef since I was 12 years old. Saw Emerald live, and I was I was enamored with this guy. This guy was a magician, right? He had the entire audience captivated because he was just talking about food, and I thought it was phenomenal, right? So I learned so much before I even went to culinary school. When you go to culinary school, they teach you the finer basics of stuff, you know, stock soups, you know, how to do this, how to do that. It's very rudimentary, and then when you get to your first restaurant, you're like, holy shit! The book goes out the window, so you don't know. Like anything they taught you is completely just null and void. Just forget everything because what you can learn in a book and what you can learn on the job are two different things. And I, I just thought it was a wild experience. Um, but getting back to you, man. So when you break in, what was the first day of your first job like? Do you remember? Like, were you crazy? Were you going crazy? Was it weird? What did you feel like? Well, I will, well, I was excited. Uh, I will tell you the, the story of how I got started. Um, one of my friends who had gone to high school with and was also in the uh, Chenard, but he was more interested in live action. He called me up and it was probably in uh, May, I think, of that year of 68. Mm -hmm. And I was now in our second year of, of art school. And um, he said, hey, uh, do you still want to get into animation? I went, yeah, of course. <laughs> but he, was, he had got a job through a friend and this lady, who I still know to this day, was had gone to the same grade school that I went to. And her husband went to the same high school that Steve and I, my other friend, went to. So she she got him the job. And he called me up and he said, hey, listen, I'm working at this place. It's called Fred Calvert Studios. And 
it's over here in North Hollywood, you know, come on over and meet Fred. And so I went over there that night and Fred was sitting at a desk doing in some in-betweens on, uh, on the, uh, the show, uh, probably, I think it was Three Musketeers for Banana Splits. And um, he sat me down in a room at another desk, the two extremes, and he said, okay, you do the in-between. Came back in a half an hour, checked the drawing. And he said, okay, you can start tomorrow. And, I'll, and here's, here's the real funny part. I'll pay you $50 a week as soon as we start using your drawings in production. <laughs> I was excited. I didn't care. I wanted in. And this was, the, I was now getting into the business. Well, he didn't pay me for over a month. Oops. And I'm, I'm sure his excuse was, well, we weren't using your, he was doing my stuff from the start, however they might've been. And it didn't matter to me because I was in, that was my start. And so the night before I started the first day, I had nightmares of, of drawings and stuff constantly moving all night long. And because I was so worked up and excited and uh, it all worked out because, I, you know, I worked, for, I, I, I started my first job in animation there. I quickly learned that this guy was not on the up and up, but that's so big deal. I mean, in, in Hollywood, in those days, there were a lot of people like that, that would abuse, you know, naive people like myself. But I was, I was grateful because I got that job and, and I was starting and that's that's how I started as an in-betweener. What was the what was that feeling like the first time you saw your name on a screen? Uh, that didn't happen for a while because in those days you didn't get screen credit. Uh, usually you didn't like if you were an assistant of any type, you, they didn't give us a, a screen credit to people in TV for that. Uh, I don't. I'm trying to remember when I first got screen credit. Probably wasn't until the late '70s, and it was probably when I was animating for an, on. I don't know, Super Friends or Yogi Space Race or some mm -hmm. some damn show for Hanna Barbera. That's probably when I got my first screen credit, and I don't recall what it was like, you know, seeing my name. But I'm I'm sure I the the lucky thing for me was because a lot of times screen credits they go in alphabetical order, like animators would be listed alphabetically, so it was easy to spot my name always. So it would either be the first or second guy. So I was always find, I'm sure it was exciting at the time because oh wow. You know, you're looking at the crawl going by, or if it wasn't not a crawl, if it was just like cut, cut to the yeah. to the next car. But, you know, I'd spot my name, and it was exciting. And um, yeah, it's a thrill. I, you know, it, it's always it's always nice to be recognized. Mm -hmm. Even to this day, if you get some kind of recognition, it's still nice. Uh, I, I I'll check out shows that I've worked on in the past to see if I can see my name, or if it's something I'm doing now in the present. If I have actually watched the show, mm -hmm. I want to see how if my I can see my name, and it's it's nice. It's cr credit is always good in this business. Yes, it is because for so long, people like yourself, the stories you've told, so many people. You said you were a big comic book fan, so I'm pretty sure you know this story: the story of Bob Kane and Bill Finger. For so sure. long, Bob yeah. Kane took 100% credit for Batman. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Kane and Bill Finger co-created Batman. Now, I think it took, what, 60 years after Bill Finger died broke and alone for him to get any kind of credit, anything that we like about Batman, from the name to the costume, to Robin, to Joker, to Alfred, to being in the manor, everything that Bill Finger set up for Bruce Wayne, everything that we know and love about Batman Bruce Wayne essentially came from Bill Finger. Yet back in these days, it's so easy to say, I did Batman, I created, so I created everything. And for so long, you know, indie, like hardcore comic book fans, the writers, the artists, the animators, and everybody else that knew Batman, they knew the story of Bill Finger, but it wasn't public knowledge. And was it a Mark Nobleman, I believe, uh, did a huge campaign, wrote a book on it. Um, and then Athena Finger's been, been keeping up with, you know, the legacy of Bill Finger and all this other stuff. So it's, it took so long. And I wish... I wish and I hope that Bill Finger would have known like how many people that this story that he created, that he helped create, excuse me, changed the lives of so many people just with Batman, you know, and like, like you were just talking about, there's so many people that get left or forgotten and then history just completely writes off and doesn't think about or doesn't bring up because these names weren't important back then. So it gets lost in the shuffle essentially. And that's like I told you in the beginning, that's why I do this podcast is so names will not go away. I don't want to sound self-righteous or anything like that, but it's, I want to know who these people are that made this cartoon, made me feel some kind of way about it. And that's what is important 
give credit when credit is due. So thank you. Um, we're going to jump a little bit ahead here because we could honestly sit here and do 12 hours. I mean, not straight, obviously, we could do 12 hours just on your career alone and still not scratch the surface. So we're going to jump ahead just a little bit because we had so many questions specifically about Samurai Jack. And that was your first Emmy, correct? Correct. With that being said, man, when was the first time that you met Gendy and you got brought on? Was it Dexter's lab and then it kind of rolled into Samurai Jack? Uh, mm, let me think. I, I'm trying to remember now the uh, how this worked. Uh, well, first off, Gendy and, and McCracken and that, the kind of, it's been called the Cal Arts Invasion came into Hanna-Barbera in uh, probably around 94, somewhere like that. And they, and they were doing the, the show Two Stupid Dogs. And I didn't really know them uh, that I didn't, I didn't, cause I wasn't working with them. I saw them around and all that. Mm -hmm. I don't think I knew, started to know Gendy until I worked on um, probably Dexter's lab. Mm -hmm. And that's where I really got to know him and, and meet him and work with him. And um, I think that was before Powerpuff Girls. Yeah, I think, yeah, pa Dexter's came what? first and then Powerpuff. So yeah, so I worked with him on, on Dexter's lab and I got to know him and uh, it, was, it was fun. I mean, he, he, he was nice to me. And it, what's interesting about that is Gendy is probably around, I don't know, he's in his early fifties. So there's a big age difference, but he didn't treat me like some old guy that, that uh, should be ignored or anything. He was very nice, always very pleasant to me to this day. In fact, I talked to him just a couple of days ago on the phone. And he's he's really nice. He's very pleasant, and he's probably one of the most talented people I've ever worked with in animation because he can do everything. Mm -hmm. He's he can write, he he can animate. He's a fantastic animator. He can uh, character design, storyboard. Um, he it, produce. He, he's he's like the total package, which is far and few between in the business. So. Um, Hopefully that answers the question about meeting him. Oh, a hundred percent it does. And everything you just said, I mean, he is my favorite animator of all time. And he's on my Mount Rushmore for sure. Um, it just, what you guys did. Now, Dexter is a completely different story. Cause one thing I absolutely love about Dexter is there's no real representation for people like me. You see red hair, pale as shit. There's no real representation for, for animation for redheaded dudes. Cause we look funny, we sound weird and all this other crazy shit. So when I saw Dexter, I was instantly hooked right here. I was like, holy shit. I mean, he doesn't look like me. He's a lot smarter than I'll ever be. But I, I, I see that I see myself in this character, right? Just being a redheaded guy. I see something similar about this. And I started watching. And then I get a little bit older and then I start watching Samurai Jack. And then I'm like, holy shit. And then I see the two names match up. I'm like, wait, wait, wait. He created Dex. You don't get one hit. Most of the time, people don't get one hit, let alone two hits. And then two hits turn into three hits. I mean, like I said, this man is a Renaissance man. He is a modern marvel uh, when it comes to animators. It's fantastic. Um, but jumping just a little bit ahead to, to Samurai Jack, do you remember that initial, what is it like getting a call? Do you just get a call? Does Gendy, you know, do people like this, once you start working with people, do they approach you and say, hey, I'm working on the show, I would love for you to come on? Or do you guys have agents and stuff like that they have to go through? Well, yeah, there are a lot of people in the animation, people uh, in animation that have agents. I've never had an agent. And I figure at this point in my career, what the hell do I need an agent for? <laughs> uh, because uh, my attitude now is like, if they call me up tomorrow and say, you're done, you know, see you later. I go, fine. I've done, I've done everything there is to do and, and I could retire. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was already, see, I, had, I, I worked with him on Dexter's. I left Dexter's, and his was funny. I, when I was working on Dexter's, I, did, I started working with him as a director on Dexter's. Mm -hmm. And now directing in those days is different from what directors now. It, people get the title of director in animation and it varies from studio to studio and, and show to show. And it's totally different now. But what you were doing as a director in, on Dexter's was uh, the director would slug the board. I don't know if your audience knows what that means, but slugging the board is where you direct the board out and bring it to a certain length. You would also be in charge of writing the sheets or if you couldn't write the sheets for yourself, then you would freelance those out. You would supervise 
the storyboard. You would supervise the uh, the BG keys and BG layouts and the models and all that and the color. And then you'd have to see each show through post and all that. But the amount of pay that they were giving you for it was not all that great at the time. And then Cow and Chicken started up and I had the opportunity to go work on Cow and Chicken, which was a lot easier for me to do. And I didn't have to do all those multiple jobs. So I said to Gendy, I'm gonna go work on Cow and Chicken, which I think could have screwed me over forever with Kenny, but it didn't because when Cow, uh, I'd already done some work, I think on Powerpuff as well. Mm -hmm. And when Cow and Chicken wrapped, I went back and to work with Gendy on, on Powerpuff. And when we moved into the Cartoon Network studios in Burbank and he started to do Samurai Jack, I was still working on Powerpuff, but it was winding down and I knew I was going to I don't remember how it worked out, but I was going to work on Samurai Jack and I, it was fine. And he just brought me in and it already, the show had already started. And uh, I started in the fir very first season. And I think I directed, I don't know how many episodes I directed in the first season, but uh, I started writing sheets on the show first so I could see what the sensibilities of the show was like. And then I started directing on the show and I worked on that show with him as well as uh, symbiotic titan star wars clone wars and uh the last thing i worked with guinea on was the revival of samurai jack which was about three years ago so it all worked out for me i didn't have an agent and then i was always in the right place at the right time hey man it sounds like somebody up there probably your parents robert are watching out for you what it sounds like man well good for them and as long as they don't ask for a cut uh, that's all right <laughs> You don't want them to get any residuals, huh? Um, yeah, man, that's, that's a fantastic story. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, so as I don't, I would love to have you come back on. If, if you're having fun, man, come back on down the road. We can talk really more in depth uh, about your career. I've got so many questions and I know you said your wife was cooking dinner, so I don't want to keep you because mine's downstairs. No, listen, no, uh, let, let me tell you something. I told, she knows that when I'm doing this and I said, I'll eat when it's done. So like, don't be, feel like you're rushed. Ask anything you want. That's what I'm here for. Oh, well, I've got, I've got way more in-depth questions from the fans here than I could ever get to. But before we get to that, because I always do the show in two parts. First part is me getting you all to myself, and then I open it up to the fans. Because in my sure. opinion, without fans of cartoons, what's the point, right? You want, you want somebody to feel something. You want somebody to be listening. There's nothing worse than being a creative person and having something to say and nobody to say it to, right? So... When I started opening this up, I didn't realize the response I was going to get. Some are a little bit of questions and some are a lot. I showed you, you have beaten out Maxwell and you have beaten out Greg so far as the top three um, questions that I've ever gotten asked. You've got six pages and yeah, I write a little bit big. However, these are six pages of questions that fans really, really want to pick your brain over. Um, but before we get to that, man, I just wanted to say thank you for everything you've done in this industry. You know, it's very rare do I get to meet people. And I mean, that's not true because I meet people all the time through this. I just ask them if they want to come on. And most of the time, everybody's real receptive and everybody's really nice. And they say, yeah, I'll come on and talk to you. And I always appreciate that. But very rarely do I get to meet somebody that has the knowledge, the experience that you have. You've worked on so many fantastic shows. You have brought so much joy just reading some of the comments because there's a bunch of people that didn't ask a question they just want to tell you how much they loved your work when when they would go and watch it and they would see your name pop up he's like i've seen that guy's name before and they would go and look back like he worked here he did this he did this he did this he he's done all of this shit that i absolutely loved as a kid as a teenager and as an adult and for that from me and to the fans and everybody else that's listening thank you for what you've done man we've really appreciated your hard work and uh getting to the fans questions um Rachel San Diego wants to know, do you remember any of the Cartoon Network bumpers and did you have any role in doing the bumpers? Uh, I don't, you know, honestly, I don't, it's hard to really remember a lot of the stuff that I've worked on over the years, but I had nothing to do with the bumpers. I think the bumpers for the most part were, if I'm not mistaken, done in Atlanta. Okay. Uh, at the Cartoon Network has a, a facility and an office uh, complex in Atlanta. That's like the home base for uh, cartoon. Well, you know, it's it's changed now, but in those days, that's where I think that stuff was done. So I had nothing to do with any of the bumpers at all. I might have, you know what? I, 
I just don't remember. I might have done something on some bumpers, but I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, and it was right out of Atlanta with Ted Turner Studios back before the uh, AOL Time Warner merger and everything like that. Um, are we already told that one? Hoax and stuff. Um, we kind of talked. <laughs> we kind of talked a little bit about Mr. Hanna. Um, did you have any issues with Hanna Barbera when it came to selecting age appropriate scenes? Here's how it works. No, here's how it works. You know, if you're doing what I'm doing, let's say at the point where I'm doing, well, especially if you go far enough back when I was just an assistant, it's like whatever, whatever is available, whatever you can work on. You don't always pick and you don't always go like, well, I don't want to work on that show. I want to work on this show. It's like, you work on what's available because especially when I first started, you only would work maybe six months out of the year and the rest of the year you'd be on un unemployment. Yeah. And that's the way it used to be. Uh, and as far as appropriate material and all that, not, I, I don't think I've ever worked on anything that was inappropriate. And uh, I just worked on whatever was presented to me. And uh, it was about earning a living. And, you know, I, I worked on a lot of stuff over the years that I don't like. Yeah. And, it, and I worked on it because it was the job that was available at the time. You, you can pretty much say that about every show that I worked on that, was, that I worked on for filmation. Yeah. I never liked any of that, that stuff at all. And I didn't particularly care for the studio. There's probably some filmation fans out there right now, you know, pushing uh, pins into a voodoo doll of me and, and you know, <laughs> get over it. Uh, I don't really don't give a shit. But uh, uh, I just worked on whatever was what you what, what was available. And I I tell people if you only work on shows that you like, you're going to be very poor because <laughs> it's not how the industry works. You. The very first guy that I worked for, Fred Calvert, summed it up best. He told me this the very first season I was working for him. He said, we are like migrant farm workers going from season to season, picking the crop. Mm -hmm. And it was true then, and it's true now. You just work on what you can get a job on. Beautiful. Um, do you remember now... I try to stay away from these type of questions because they are, it's, it's very hard for you guys to sit there and try to remember something you worked on 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, depending on who I'm talking to. Um, so if, if we come up to any question that you just don't understand, or you don't, um, you don't remember, we can completely gloss over, but um, hoax and stuff, he's got one or two more. And he wanted to know, or she, excuse me, um, what is one accident that made it into the show, but still worked? You ever worked on a show that you know, maybe an accident happened where that shouldn't have been that way, but it worked out in the end. I, you know, I'm sure it happened a lot, probably a lot more than I'm aware of, you mm -hmm. know, where you might have done something um, that was just a, a mistake and it, and it stayed in. And uh, I can think of a couple of stories like uh, my friend Tim Walker said, this was a joke, but it was probably not too far from the truth. He said, yeah, when he was working at the Patty Freeling, he said, yeah, they didn't call retakes there unless the character was missing his head. And, uh, <laughs> I, and that's probably an exaggeration. But sometimes Bill Hanna was a good example of that is Bill Hanna. He was editing a show with a, in the editing room with some guy with an editor one day. And it was I don't know, but this probably was in the 70s or something like that. And the editor, when he got to the finish of the show, the editor said, you know, Mr. Hanna, I think there was some other stuff we could have called. And Bill Hanna went back through the show, showing him all the things he could have called, but didn't because it's about money. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, a lot of stuff gets on the screen. It's now, not so much nowadays, but back like in the, in the late 60s, 70s and 80s, that was just, you know, crap. And they didn't call because it's all about money. So like you would see stuff that's not so great. And um, I can't... I can't think of a particular instance of anything I worked on that I know for a fact was bad and should have been a retake, but I'm sure it, I'm sure it happened. Beautiful. Um, and then his last question, well, it's not even really a question, it's a statement. And I, I, I would love to see this happen. Um, we want the Scotsman spinoff. Any chance you can make that happen, Robert? <laughs> well, you know, he's referring to the character in Samurai Jack, I think. And, uh, uh, no, I, I have nothing to do with anything that Gindy does. And I think Samurai Jack, as far as Gindy's concerned, is dead in the sense that he's done that, been there. 
he's doing two shows now for for Adult Swim, mm -hmm. and I don't think he's ever going to revisit. Sa Samurai Jack was supposed to have been done as a feature, and it was supposed to be done some. Uh, there was all kinds of things that never came about. He he did Samurai Jack the last version uh, three years ago because he told me the story that he was sitting on the toilet and he called up Mike Lazo, the head of Adult Swim, who used to be one of the guys in charge of, of Cartoon Network. And he said, I have got this idea, you know, I want, you know, I want to finish off Samurai Jack and everything, blah, blah, blah. And Mike said, okay, great. But so that's done. So the Scotsman is not going to come back. Uh, I will tell you though, in the days when we were doing Samurai Jack, this was pre-digital and the storyboards were all done traditionally mm -hmm. and they would be pinned up on the, on the, on bulletin boards and around a big conference room. And we used to do storyboard pitches for every episode. And this one, at least, I think at least twice, Brian, uh, Mark Andrews, Mark Andrews was the co-director of the film Brave for Pixar and he won an Academy Award for it. He is a fantastic storyboard artist and he's phenomenal when he does pitches and he would do the pitch for his stuff on, on the Scotsman st stories. And he'd do this great voice and he was really loud and he was great just to watch. And those were fun times, but the Scotsman coming back, I would say it's like, it's probably 99% sure that it'll never happen, but you know what? stuff happens in animation. I wouldn't be shocked if it happened, but it, it, that's all up to Gendy or less or Cartoon Network because he doesn't really own that stuff. Cartoon Network could say, screw you, we're going to do the Scotsman show and there'd be nothing you can do about it, but it probably would never happen. I hope it doesn't. It happened to so many creators and we talked about it during the Maxwell episode. It was a Stuart Schneider. Um, I don't want to bring up any of that, that shit again because... <clears throat> It's just, it's, it's already been said, it's already been talked about, but um, he brought up, you know, him and Gendy and uh, Craig just getting the ax essentially because Cartoon Network wanted to go in a more realistic route because that's, they want to compete with Disney and Nickelodeon, right? They want to take cartoon at a Cartoon Network. Um, so I don't think that they would do that again to Gendy. I hope that Gendy got to say everything he wanted to say with Samurai Jack, with any, any property that anybody does, I hope beyond hope that, that at least now with how easy it is to connect to people and how easy it is for information flow, right? That some of these companies that used to get away with the shit that we were talking about with, you know, no credit, you know, just taking over somebody's IP. I hope that that shit is the thing of the past because for so long, so many of you guys have just gotten used up, tossed to the side, and then we'll look for somebody new. And like I said, I, I hope that's the thing of the past. Well, I'll give you an example of how it doesn't always work the way you're saying, because like, you know, Cartoon Network did a couple of years ago, we did, uh, they, re they brought back Powerpuff Girls, which yeah. I worked on almost all of those episodes. And I had asked to work on that show because I thought, wow, I like the original Powerpuff Girls and this will be fun. Mm -hmm. It wasn't anything like the original Powerpuff show. I don't think, personally, I didn't care for it that much. The, the stories weren't as good. It wasn't as funny. They, they eliminated certain characters and they even changed the design of the backgrounds, which I don't understand. And it, But that's usually what happens when somebody revised a show that they had nothing to do with in the beginning. And the only reason why that happened at all was because internationally, the market was there. The international people wanted Powerpuff Girls to come back because of the merchandising. And um, it, you know, it happens. And almost every time a show is revived or a character is revived by somebody else or another studio, it's never as good as the original. I, I can't think of an example where you go, uh, maybe you can, but I can't think of an example where someone revived a character in a show and it was 100% better than the original. No, not when it comes to shows, but even then it's not really a revival as much as it is a sequel. The only thing that I can really think of was Terminator 2 was way better than Terminator 1. And The Godfather 2 was on par. It wasn't as good as The Godfather yeah. 1, but very rarely do you get sequels that are anywhere as good as the original. So no, I 100% agree with you on that one. Well, I'm, I'm still going to talk about animation because I, yeah, that, that's I, I, I once was talking to somebody on the phone and I think it might have been Ron Myrick. He was uh, producing it at Warner Brothers. and. Uh, uh, I was told, well, he's developing 
and it never happened. He's I'm developing a top cat. And I said, what's to develop? Yeah. It's been done, you know, and you can't, you could, even then you couldn't bring back the, the show because most of the original voices were, were gone. Mm -hmm. And if they had brought it back, it would have been shitty. It would, it would never have looked as good. It wouldn't have the same type of writing. Would, everything would have been crappy. Yeah. But yeah. that's what happens to animation. That's one of my favorite cartoons. And I hope, I, I, I hope beyond hope that, that people really, before I say that, do you feel like you guys got to say everything you wanted to say? And did you guys get any pushback on anything with the revival of Samurai Jack a couple years back? Well, I, I have no say in any of these, these things at all, but I will tell you this about Gendy. Gendy is, uh, by that point, is, he's a, a powerful driving force because he's proven himself with his directing uh, the Hotel 3 cartoon you know, features mm -hmm. and doing all the stuff he's done. So he, at that point, his very little pushback to Gendy and Gendy's... Um, like with Primal and, and, and the show that the new show that he's doing, Unicorn Show, he's not the one that's going to sit there and, and take notes from people. Good. Uh, he, he's because uh, his attitude is like, screw you, I'll just go somewhere else. Yeah. And um, he, I don't think he got hardly any pushback at all. And, but that's, he's the exception to the rule. Everybody else that's, especially young creators, um, the way it works out is you get development people attached to your show and then they've always got all kinds of ideas and they always want to put their stink on the project. Yeah. And, and then you have standards and practices telling you all the stuff that you can't do. And it's, yeah, it's, it's a difficult process, but you have to admire anybody that gets a show on at all, because even the worst show on, on an animation that you might see, you, you got to realize they went through hell to get that show on air. Yeah, I mean, there's only two creators, and then I've, I've talked to, with the exception of Danny Antonucci, and I'm, I don't know if you know who that is. I'm pretty sure you yeah. do short running around yeah. this field. I, I don't know him personally, but I yeah. know of him. Yeah. But all the stories that I've heard of both Gendy and Dana, Danny Antonucci, especially when Gendy came back to do Samurai Jack the second time, it's been a very, no, no, this is my story. This is mine. I'm going to wrap this up the way I want to do it. So they are the exception as far as the the creators that i've heard about that have you know gotten to tell their story their way and then yeah again he came back with with samurai jack for the revival and got to finish it out i guess the way he wanted to finish it out and with danny he got to finish it out with the movie he got to say everything he wanted to say so it's it's refreshing to hear even though there's hundreds of probably thousands of creators and animators that didn't get to tell their story at least we got somebody in the wind column on you guys' side. They got to tell their story their way and, and they didn't have to sit here and just say, no, I, I'm, I'm not going to do that because my name has weight. Your name doesn't mean anything. So I love hearing that type of stuff that people are still sticking to their laurels and they still get to do what their heart is telling them to do or what their brain is telling them to do or what their gut is telling them to do. So it's refreshing to hear that. Um, AJ3J would like to know, um, that's another Scotsman one. Um, he would like to learn uh, more about Aku's daughters and the high priest. Uh, and he would be great to see John DiMaggio back. Um, you know, of course, the Scotsman. Um, but do you remember uh, anything about the daughters of Aku and the high priestess? Do you remember pitching anything or hearing people pitch stuff about that? I'm trying to remember what that is. Is that from the revival stuff yeah. or is that from? Well, yeah. Once again, let me explain how it works. Um, when Gendy came back to Cartoon Network to do that, uh, I don't remember the conversation, but I probably asked him, you know, about working on the show and all that. So whenever an episode was ready for me to work on, it was like, you know, okay, here's the footage, you know, and you know, I didn't, have, I never asked questions. I didn't say to him like, well. Uh, what are you doing or anything because I, I by then i already understood gindi I, I, yeah. I could read his his handwriting which is well, sometimes difficult and uh so that you know I, I i'm not involved with the process of of making the the, the you know having to deal with the networks and i think it's like here's the work you know see when it's done which is probably usually you know several days what i don't remember the time limit 
so I have no, I, I don't have anything to do with what that question you know, is asking. I don't have anything to do with the process of kick, you know, feedback or any of that stuff. Gotcha. Um, Bubblegum Serper 3 wants to know, um, hey, Robert, have I ever told you that the Peach Creek Cobblers are going to win the playoffs tonight? I don't even know what the hell they're talking about. Well, the Peach Creek Cobblers were a football team in Ed, Ed, and Eddie. I don't know what they were referencing either because there's no real crossover with Samurai Jack or anybody else. So, um, but they just wanted to tell you that. Uh, Hoodie Moore, oh, was some, what's that? I was going to say, well, good for him. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that he's happy about the Peach Street Cobblers <laughs> or whatever the hell that shit is. <laughs> That was the, uh, the football team from Ed, Ed, and Eddie. Um, Hoodie Moore wants to know, what is your favorite and least favorite show that you've ever worked on? That's a good question, because I have uh, a, a favorite-wise, probably uh, Samurai Jack, okay. because it was the most rewarding. And um, least favorite is probably a long list of shows there, because... Um, uh, <laughs> Just about anything I worked on for filmation, uh, which was like um, She-Ra. I worked on She-Ra and, and I hated that. And uh, Ghostbusters, I worked on their one of their features, um, Pinocchio and the Emperor of the Night, and I didn't like that. Uh, Show-wise, um, gosh, I don't know, you know. Um, for me, the problem is this. You know, after 53 years of working in the business, it's hard to remember something from way back when, unless somebody goes, what about, and then they point out the show and then you go, okay, now I remember, but I'd have to look at a list of stuff and I could probably go down and listen and go like, yeah, that sucked, that sucked, that was a piece <laughs> of shit, that I hated that, that guy was a prick, you know, and, and you know, a lot of times in animation, you know, I don't, I, I'm only speaking for myself, but you work with people that you don't particularly like. Yeah. But you do it and, you know, it's a job and you got to get through it. And I've worked with some real assholes. And uh, I could tell you stories about those people if you wanted to know. But uh, uh, so there's probably a lot of shows that I've worked on that are not favorites of mine. But once again, it goes back to what I said before. You don't always work on what you like. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's what's in front of you and what's available. And it's like it's the job and it was the paycheck. And, and you know, and, and we all have bills and mortgages and all that sort of things and responsibilities. So, you know. In animation, especially for me, when I started, the business was like, like I said before, you'd work six months and then be off six months. Now, when I was early on, when I was working, Fred Calvert, that first season, I was only getting $50 a week, but I was still living at my parents' home. And uh, by 1970, when I was not living at that, my parents' house, and I think my salary was $125 a week, but everything was relative back then. You know, everything was a lot less expensive and everything. Yeah. But still, that wasn't a lot of money. So I would freelance, do a freelance assistant work because I wanted to make as much money as I could because I knew it was only for a short period of the year that you'd work. And then the rest of the year, you're on unemployment, which really sucked in those days. Yeah. And uh, and looking for something that was going to open up. But uh, that's probably why I got into the mentality of like, I used to tell friends of mine, like, never say no to any job. Yeah. say yes to everything and then figure out later how you're going to do it that's that's great advice to have right um now you said you said samurai jack was the most rewarding i think is what you said why was it why was it so rewarding well you know it, it was re it was rewarding in the sense that it, i think it's the show speaks for itself it's a great show the the show is phenomenal it was different from everything else that was done before it and uh, and it's still different from a lot of shows that are being done now. And I think a lot of people have copied Gendy's style and Gendy's uh, storytelling and all that. It was the re it was just rewarding because prior to that, I had worked on shows that were Emmy nominated. But you know, you'd go to the Emmys only to hear, th and the winner is The Simpsons. And you go, son of a bitch, those pricks again. And uh, uh, and so I just got, you know, it was rewarding in the sense that. In fact, that night when we won for Samurai Jack, when they when they announced the the, the category, which was um, that was the half hour category, I think, um, they said, and the winner and the award goes to and all. All I heard was 
the S sound of samurai coming out. And at first I thought, oh no, it's a Simpsons thing. Because it, it, all of a sudden it goes into slow motion. Yeah. And when they said Samurai Jack, I stood up and screamed. <laughs> and because and I, I couldn't believe it and couldn't wait. The Simpson people all left right at that point because they were, you know, they weren't going to be good sports because they didn't win like they had been winning all the other previous years. And they just got up and left, which I thought was, well, screw them anyways. And uh, the, they have it, in fact, in the academy now, they have a Simpson rule. Where it's a cap of 21. You can't have more than 21 people on the ticket because the Simpsons used to win and to go up with a, like a football team and it'd be like 40 people up there and you have gone, son of a bitch. And a lot of them didn't even work on the particular episode, but they just were on the ticket. So that night was, you know, it, it all came into place. And by chance that night, what was interesting, they used to have a category called um, hour and above, which was not a must win category. It, it didn't have to be a winner. You had to get a certain percentage of yes votes in order to win. But I had two nominations. There was only two nominated shows in that category. One was Star Wars Clone Wars, and then one was Powerpuff uh, Christmas special that I had worked on. And I figured going in there with those two, I didn't realize at the time that both of them could not have be no, nothing. But I didn't know that the rule then. But I figured oh, I'm going to win something because I got these two categories. So when they said Samurai Jack before that, we get up, we go up on stage. I'm excited as you couldn't believe. And we answered her, you know, we're done. We start to walk back and I grab Guinea and go, wait a minute, because I wanted to hear about the next category. So we just got behind the curtain and they go, Star Wars, Clone Wars. We just turn around, go back out on stage because it was like two Emmys in one night. I was really ex excited. But to answer your question, probably the most rewarding was Samurai Jack. I, I got to imagine, and I don't know how to phrase this because when I when I try to articulate the words that I'm about to say when it comes to Samurai Jack specifically, this show, and you can correct me if I'm wrong as far as trying to explain it. I've and one of the questions in here in later later pages it, it brings it up, and I've never ever watched a television show whether um well that's not true a live action you can bring up Breaking Bad if you've ever watched that show you'll get what I'm getting ready to say. Um, but as far as cartoons go, and especially in today's day and age where attention spans or, oh, look, keys, oh, squirrel, where everybody's looking around, nobody has the attention span to sit down and watch something without pulling up their phone or looking at their iPad or people's brains are all over the place, right? So Samurai Jack and Gendy specifically is a master of silence and a master of emotion. What you guys did, and you guys had plenty of frames in there where it was just Jack, you just sitting there nothing happening all you're seeing is sweat come down all you're seeing is his eyes narrow or his eyebrows go up or something along those lines something is happening where there's so much tension that's going on right now it's palpable right i don't know how to explain that other than i just explained it you guys were the master of that the suspense i guess is a, is probably the best word of that and i've never seen a cartoon before or since have that kind of caliber of you no, know, and especially with Primal, right? We'll get to Primal, perfect example. The entire first season, not one word is uttered. It's not until the final, final what, episode of season two, when I can't remember her name, um, but it's the female, she comes in, she was the slave and she was in shackles and then uh, Spear breaks him up and all this other stuff. And then she starts trying to teach him language, right? So you go, shit maybe six seven hours of a television show and not one word is uttered and it's crazy that that show exists in today's day and age with attention spans the way they are i've never seen a creator do this and i don't is there a word for that kind of style is it just gendy style i mean it's it's immaculate and beautiful is what i'm getting at well yeah i think it's it's you have to attribute it all to gendy yeah you know obviously gendy gets together with um the people who like uh, on primal Derek Bachman who is writing uh, with him mm -hmm. but you know Derek is going to know know what Gendy wants yeah. and uh that's Gendy's style for for Samurai Jack and uh, primal mm -hmm. and uh but it's not always that way you know like yeah. his new show that he's working on I'm sure it's, I'm for sure it's got all kinds of dialogue in it because it's more of a traditional show and Dexter's Lab and Symbiotic Titan had plenty of dialogue. It's just that this is the style of the show and, and 
and Genny's really good at doing it. It was just, now I only bring this up because I try to like make parallels to something so I can understand it. Cause I'm not a very smart person. I just sit here and try to pull everything I know. And then somehow I can talk about stuff. But did you ever watch wrestling back in the day? Well, yeah, well here. Now, when I was into wrestling it was when I was a, probably around, you know, 13, 12. And locally here in wrestling, it was on channel five and it came from the Olympic auditorium. And this old actor, Dick Lane, was like the MC. Yeah. And uh, yeah, all my friends, we all like, oh, this is great. You know, because it wasn't as pumped up the way they are now. And it yeah. wasn't, you know, they didn't have the great, you know, all the big stuff that they do now. But yeah, I liked wrestling back then. But, you know, I, I quickly lost any interest in wrestling. Oh, a hundred percent. Like most people do. I still watch it. It's the only show with my work schedule, the podcast, and then just trying to get everything ready for the baby coming in a couple of weeks. I have very little time. Um, so wrestling is the only thing that I can consistently watch that's new on a live week to week basis. Cause it's only like an hour and a half, two hours. And then I watch it over four or five days and I'm caught up for the week. And then next week rolls around, I'm ready for the next episode. But there was a wrestler. Do you know who Jake the Snake Roberts is? Oh yeah. I remember him. Okay. So he would, he would have this, this cadence, right? where he would talk, but he would talk so lowly that you would think that the volume was turned down and you would just see his lips moving. And it, you would have to say, hey, shut up, Jake's talking right now. You would have to sit there and listen because he would draw you in. Most people, they get up there, they yell, they scream and all this other stuff. That's what I equate Samurai Jack to. You had to physically, if most of the time people watch stuff and they have it on the background, they're doing something, they're cleaning the house, they're folding laundry, they're doing something. And that's just a placeholder. They're trying to keep the quiet out, right? But with Samurai Jack, you can't really do that. You have to physically watch this because there's so much character development and no dialogue. I just think it's it's beautiful. It's it's something that is lost in, for me, just lost in animation as far as today goes. And different styles of shows have different ways of doing it. But it is a true sign of a master of their craft when it comes down to it. It's, it's a, just a beautiful show. And I can't agree with you more. Samurai Jack. Um, is going to go down as probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest show Cartoon Network has ever pushed out. Um, uh, let's see, we're on the next page. All right. Um, so AJ's back here. And I didn't know this, so I don't know if any of this is true or not, because he doesn't leave a name on here. But AJ asks again, since one of the storyboard artists is a Wushu Kung Fu practitioner, did they have... Oh, any, yeah. Did they have... Any, what's that? Go ahead. I know who you're talking about. Go ahead. Okay, okay cool. Because um, there's some of these times where they where they write in stuff and then it's just completely fictitious. Um, so, but he, uh, he said, yeah. How can you choreograph the fight scenes from real life to animation? So was this, when they were, when you guys were laying out fight scenes, did, did he have a big role in it or she, excuse me? I don't know who this person is. It, it's Brian Andrews. Brian Mark and Andrews. Mark Andrews, the guy I told you that would do these great yeah. storyboards of Scotsman. Brian Andrews is the brother. Brian is into that exactly what you're talking about martial arts mm -hmm. mark and brian i used when they were cal art students from what i was told they used to uh do uh sword play and stuff and took lessons or whatever and they're into that brian's storyboards for action are good for that because he knows the that particular martial art and so he's really good at posing out the fight so all the all the key poses are there for you and uh, I, I remember on this one episode of uh, Symbiotic Titan that I was uh, doing directing on, and he um, had it was a it was I I think it was a sword fight, and um, this big climactic sword fight between the the main hero and the big villain, which I can't remember who they are now, but um, he had all these poses on the board, and it was just a question of figuring out the timing from this pose to the next pose and that pose, and it. it turned out great because brian is really good at that action stuff he does a lot of storyboarding for the um the marvel superhero live action films now yeah i it's funny as soon as you as soon as you said his name i kicked myself in the ass because i just reached out to him not too long ago to see if he'd like to come on as well and now i feel like an asshole because i didn't know he was into whoosh I'm trying to figure out like what you guys are into and what you guys do that's not specifically animation is just wild and like i said it just looks like i have egg on my face now but that's neither here nor there, because AJ wants to ask again about Scotsman, but we're not going to do that. Um, and I don't know if you know this, uh, but is is there an alternate ending from Battle Through Time, and is it canon? I'm assuming he's talking about the video game, I think. Do you know anything about that? No, I don't even know what you're talking about. 
Okay, me neither. Um, Mark's Jonathan 71 wants to know, um, do you know why some of the episodes of Dexter's Lab either ended on a joke abruptly or abruptly? And was it because of the writing style or timing? Uh, it's probably this. Uh, first off, those, those shows weren't scripted. Those shows would have the same with what happened on Powerpuff Girls. Mm -hmm. They uh, were they would sit in a room first to decide what the story what it was going to be about, and they would throw out a bunch of ideas and they would come up with a story outline, which might be two pages, maybe three pages or, or less. And the board artist would get that, and then the board artist would board have to board out everything, throwing in dialogue, and you know the, all the, whatever gags might be, and that became the script for recording. And so some shows are gonna be better than others because some board artists were just better than others. Yeah. Some were really funny. Some were just you know, getting the job done. It just depended on who was doing what. So some shows are gonna end probably not as well as the audience liked it. And some are gonna end fairly well. So it's just the best way I could explain it. Oh, that's that you, you broke it down a lot better than I could have, man. So I appreciate that. Um, Co Cosmic Comics Productions wants to know, <laughs> what was it like working on the Yellow Submarine? That film had a huge impact on me when I was younger. You know, I'll tell you something. Uh, that was in 1968. So I don't have a lot of vivid memories of it. I'll tell you why. I was working there at Fred Calvert Productions on, on Banana Splits, which had two cartoons in it. Um, Arabian Nights and Three Musketeers. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I got to work on Yellow Sub is they were, the studio had like people that were just renting space. It wasn't a big studio, it was a, a really it was an old house. And it was a small apartment building on the same lot that had two, two units down, two units up. So it was like, it was like an animation community. Mm -hmm. And two of the guys shared a room, a really small room, which later on in the early eighties, I went back to that place and rented that same room. <laughs> uh, they, one was Ron Campbell, who just passed away in January this year. And the other one is Dwayne Crowler, who's long gone too. Ron was contacted by the, the people doing the feature because he had already done work on the Beatles television show when he was in Australia. And it was basically the, you know, the same company producing the feature. And Dwayne was a really good uh, commercial animator and he was a really good animator. So they contacted these guys and I was just in the right place at the right time. And uh, it, it was a thing where probably had a lot to do with the way these guys worked, you know, waiting to the last minute to get something done. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, everybody switch off from doing the Hanna-Barbera stuff and go work on the yellow sub because they're behind schedule. And it was just sheer luck. So I don't have, a lot of vip my only memories of the actual work on the on the film are i remember it was like uh the splotching sequence at the end with blue meanies get flowers all over them and i can remember you know doing the, the those flowers on the blue meanies that's my only memory of it other than that um i would go in early in the morning and and go through the trash cans in, in uh ron and Dwayne's room and if it was in the trash it was free. It was mine. So that's how I wound up with a lot of uh, layouts and discarded animation drawings and model sheets from, from Yellow Sub. But I don't have a lot of vivid memories of it. Beautiful. Um, <clears throat> uh, my buddy Larry, the guy that does all of my, uh, my tech stuff for me, so he makes all of this, because you see the same thing I see right now. He takes all of this and he makes it look really, really pretty at the end. Um, but Larry wants to know, um, was there any cartoons animation style that is the most memorable to, memorable to you? Not so much something that you might have worked on, but maybe something you saw, or maybe if you want to take one that you worked on and then one that you didn't work on, but you really, really got some kind of influence from or stuck out the most to you. Well, yeah, I mean, I like I like vintage animation. Like I'm th I'm talking about stuff from the '40s and 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 '50s more than present day. And when I watch animation now, which I do quite frequently now, especially seeing being held up in the house all this time now, yeah. um, I like to watch uh, Tom and Jerry's, mm -hmm. uh, Tex Avery from MGM days, yeah. Warner Brothers from the uh, late 40s and 50s. And that stuff is kind of my favorite. 
as far as TV, I don't really, I don't really watch, to be honest with you. I don't watch the new stuff hardly at all. I might be turning the channel and something's on and I've never seen before. I might stop and watch for a brief period, yeah. but I'm not really that interested in what's being done these days. And uh, stuff that I've worked on, yeah, I, 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 we, we haven't really talked about it, but I uh, like the two shorts that I got to do at Hannibal Burr for What a Cartoon because that was an experience where I got to do any, everything and no one said, you can't do that. So I got to write it, storyboard, direct it, animate on it, art direct it, you, you know, the whole thing. And that was fun. But I've, I've worked on a lot of stuff over the years that when it was said and done, I went, yeah, that, that was a good show. And uh, Over the Garden Wall was a good experience. Um, obviously, Samurai Jack was a good experience. Uh, there, there's been a number of shows that I like, but style-wise, I like the vintage stuff better than modern stuff. That's because I'm an old. That's because I'm an old fossil. <laughs> well, you brought up you brought up your pilot, and I, like I told you before we started talking, because we've been talking off and on for a couple weeks and a couple months now at this point, because this year is just starting to fly by. We're already halfway done with this year, which is wild when you think about it, right? Um, but your pizza boy with big tips, man. I real this one. That short specifically, and there was another one, and I know it's Two Fat Cats. I want to say it's Drip, Drip something, but it's the Two Fat Cats. And I know you didn't do this one, but these two shorts specifically stood out so much to me. Because I remember flipping on, I think it was on on Friday nights when I was growing up with the What a Cartoon and the Cartoon Cartoon, all that movement before they started rolling into Dexter's Lab and Cow and Chick. And before those shows became on the air, I think everybody started releasing shorts. And then shortly after that, that's when everything started getting picked up to series and all this other stuff. Pizza Boy, man. No tip is what, no tip was the tagline, right? Right. Because he was trying to get the big tip. Um, and I just recently watched it over the last couple of weeks. Um, and I forgot like how fun it was. Um, did Donovan Cook work with you at all for this? Because I know, because that's that's the first thing yeah. I thought of was, was Two Stupid Dogs because it was just the, the animation <laughs> style. Um, but it was yeah. really, really fun when I'm sitting here watching this because I was like, holy shit, I remember this. When you started doing your, your 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 pilot here, Pizza Boy, was this from a past experience? Did you used to be a Pizza Boy and you had you had a guy yelling at you? How did yeah. you come up with this one? I'll tell you what happened was I started working on, I, I worked on probably more of the What a Cartoon shorts than anybody else because I, I was the animation director on a lot of the other people's shorts okay. who were young novice guys that didn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. So I worked on a lot of stuff. And so I'm working on some of these shorts and I'll be honest with you. I said to myself, because uh, a lot of my thought were shitty and I thought well hell I can do something as bad as this so I, I decided I was going to give it a try and the pizza boy thing came about by I did a drawing one day of what pizza boy was or something it was just doodling or something and I wrote on the piece of paper pizza boy mm -hmm. and and then I started thinking like well what could he what could happen and it just snowballed you know then I thought well okay he's got to deliver pizzas you know then I thought well what's a really hard thing you know yeah, so he has to deliver pizzas to the Arctic Circle. He's got to get it there fast if he wants to get a big tip. And, and you know, it, and it was just a series of gags. And I had, that's how it came about. And it was the same thing with the, the other one I did, Tumbleweed Tax, mm -hmm. was, uh, it was just, you know, write, writing something down on paper. And the premise, the basic premise with Tumbleweed Tax was, here's a, a, an outlaw that's stuck in the, what is it, the second grade? Yeah. And because he's stupid. And I thought, well, okay, then what happens next? And I actually did a board for a, 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 another short before I did Tumbleweed Tex, which they rejected, which I thought would have been really funny. And I still think it's a funny idea. I was uh, watching the news one night and um, I saw this thing on the news about these people who had a dog that was so hyper that it, it, something was wrong with the dog. It would go grab like a chunk of wood, like a log, and start chewing on chewing it. And they, they couldn't break the habit of this dog doing that. So they took it to the vet and the vet put it on um, Prozac. <laughs> and, and I thought, I went, damn, that's a funny idea. A crazy dog who's got a mania for logs. And I did this whole thing about this dog that was in love with a log. And it starts out with him setting a dinner place for this log by a fireplace. And he's talking to it like it's his lover and all that. And his, his owner comes in and, basically I'm, I'm cutting down just briefing making it brief but gets him ties him up and throws it takes him drives him like a maniac to this place that's a 
a, basically a dog insane asylum and he throws him in the night drop and uh and then he's in there and he finally breaks out and he goes through a series of trauma you know with logs and all that sort of thing and then at the very end he falls in love and for all you people who are thinking about ripping me off don't uh so he <laughs> he falls in love with he has this new mania which turns out to be mailboxes yeah. And at the very end, he comes in and he's coming home from work. He's got a heart. Now he's a dog. He's got a hard hat on and lunch pail. He comes in and there's his supposedly wife who is a big mailbox. And then there's a little mailbox in a high chair with a bib on. And he taps the wife and letters fall out. And, and he thinks like, oh, no, she's been unfaithful to me and blah, blah, blah. You know, so they rejected that story for the dumbest reason I've ever heard on the planet. The guy who was the, the development guy that was attached to it with me came back after they didn't green light it and he said to me, Yeah, they rejected it because they thought it was too much like Chris Belushi's log commercial things that he did. And I went, What? They missed the whole point. It's nothing, it's nothing like his. And first of all, it's about a crazy dog. He, he could have been in love with garden hoses. It's got nothing to do with the prop. So uh that's one that I didn't get to do, and I wish I had. Those sons of bitches, man. Hopefully, well, hopefully, man. If you submit a short like that or, a, you know, something that you're trying to get greenlit and they reject it, they don't own anything, correct? They don't know. They don't. Here's the point. Well, I now technically own Tumbleweed Text and Pizza Boy. Not that anything's going to happen with it. But here's a, another funny story. There was a, a, a supervising producer on the shorts. His name is Larry Huber. Now, I knew Larry. I got Larry his first job in the business in 1969 because I was working at Fred Calvert's. And he also went to Chouinard, but he was a year ahead of me. So he, he left the school before I did. He was the supervising producer. And Larry is the type of guy that is super loyal to whoever is the boss that he is working for. I liken him to like the Vichy French in World War II, where he just bends over and lets the Germans come in. <laughs> and I was sitting in my room and I had a big standee made of the dog from that so I was talking about and the dog's name was it was tweak tweak dog yeah and he's the standy was of him with this wide-eyed expression and he's got a straight jacket so you don't really see his yeah. uh, his arms you just see his feet sticking out and he's got this straight jacket on and Larry says to me I'm working on probably at the time tumbleweed text and he said well there's a there's a character for a short that's never going to get made and that really pissed me off so I looked over and I said oh yeah I can go out of here right now and go pitch this anywhere I want. And he goes, no, you can't because you're not allowed to do that. And I go, I never signed it. You were supposed to sign an agreement. If you worked in-house mm -hmm. and, you, and you were going to do something for them, you were supposed to sign an agreement saying that if you were rejected, that you wouldn't take it anywhere else for six months after you leave. They never made me sign anything. So I technically still own that character. And he, he immediately says, well, I'm, 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 well, you got all flustered. He goes, I'm going to go talk to legal. But I could tell you more stories about Larry, but I won't. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, I, I forgot what the initial question was, but uh, that was a fun experience working on the shorts. No, well, it was just, uh, do you own Do you own the, the rights if, if they don't get picked? Yeah, up? what happens is you don't own the film, mm -hmm. the, like the Tub and We Text and the, and the Pizza Boy. Cartoon Network still owns the film, but the character rights revert back to you. So like, in theory, if I wanted to do something with those characters, I could. But have you, have you thought about that? I mean, there's a lot of no. things out there for fans that fans of uh, fans of you and then fans of just animation in general. There's a lot of stuff that people like I said, I remember seeing this as a little kid and then going back and rewatching it. I had just as much fun, if not more fun laughing at this shit, especially when he was beating the shit out of the alligator with the pizza box was one of my yeah. favorite scenes during that entire, you know, I think it's like a seven minute clip or something like that or a seven minute episode. Um, I'm pretty sure if you put it up there on some kind of Kickstarter or some kind of fan thing, we could throw some money towards it. We could help, you know, get this shit made. Cause I would, I would like to see, you know, five, six series, five, six episodes of pizza boy flushed out. Well, first off, um, it's a different world now and they're just not making cartoons like that. You know, if you, if you look at what's be, being produced for, for like even streaming stuff, it's not that kind of wacky, uh, you know, broad gag stuff and secondly when i did the those shorts uh, those were in the mid 90s and so that was like 25 25 26 years ago and i was a lot younger and had a lot more energy i don't have the energy like that anymore and it's i i don't 
I couldn't see myself doing that and, and, and trying to go fight with uh, executives and pitching. You still have to get somebody to, to, to want to do it. Yeah. And I just don't see myself doing that. So, uh, yeah, those two characters. Look, if, if there was a big demand from some network, that would be tempting, but it's never going to happen. Uh, so I don't see myself doing anything with Tumbleweed Tex or Pizza Boy in the future. I got you. Um, we already talked about that one. Um, is there any, now this is just your recommendations, but is there any must watches for aspiring directors and lovers of animations? Do you have like one or two that you would say, hey, if you love this medium, check these out? <coughs> well, what I would tell them if they're young is get acquainted with what came before you. Mm -hmm. Don't just get stuck on what's being done now. Yeah. Don't look at just like, it, <clears throat> um, I try to think of what's, what's a pocket, oh, okay, I'll pick SpongeBob. Don't just watch SpongeBob. Mm -hmm. Go look at what was done in the 30s, the 40s, the 50s. Go look at some vintage stuff. Go, even go look at early television stuff to see what's been done. You can learn <clears throat> from that and um, broaden your horizons. I gotta take a sip of something. No problem. One of the one of the problems of old age is that for me it's like sometimes I if I'm talking and for a while my throat might get dry. But I would tell them to uh, really uh, look at a lot of what came before them, and you would be surprised. I've had this conversation with Gindi. Mm -hmm. um, young artists in animation today don't have a knowledge of what came before them. They don't even care. Yeah, it, it, you can mention certain names of. of great animators from the past and they'll go never heard of them because they don't they may have seen the cartoons and stuff that they've worked on but they don't pay attention to the credits they don't have a desire that all that much most of them not all of them but most of them of what came before them and it, it's it's all about what's in front of them uh, what they had for dinner last night because they can show you the picture on their cell phone <laughs> and um you know they're just self-absorbed in, in in themselves and what's and they don't really care if if someone wants to be a director, I would say learn the craft yeah. and learn what it takes to be a director. Uh, it helps if you're if you've animated because mm -hmm. then you have an understanding how things move. And if you don't, you you got to start learning. Watch a lot of old cartoons and and yeah. see what was done and try to figure out how they did it. Uh, it's it's not. It's not the hardest job in the world, but it's not something you just fall into like one day and say, I'm going to be a director and the next day you're a director. Because I work with people who call themselves directors and they really don't know what the hell they're doing. A good director can direct anything. A bad director can't even direct traffic. <laughs> this is uh, the last one from Dead Factor 117. Uh, and this is a really good one because out of all of the theme songs, Samurai Jack, it stands out the most um, from this era. Uh, how important is a good theme song slash intro? Uh, Samurai Jack's is iconic and he still gets visuals whenever he hears the opening for Samurai Jack. Well, that's true of any any successful show and, uh, and whatever you- One second. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, it, it all gets down to what you like. And if you think even back farther back in the past, you know, like, Take the, the theme for the Flintstones. Mm -hmm. People hear that theme and they know instantly what the this, this show is about and they remember the Flintstones and all that. For this particular person, Samurai Jack rem reminds him of, uh, or her, whoever it is, of the show and visuals. Mm -hmm. A good theme helps. Yeah, it, it's, it makes a big difference. Um, uh, that's true of any successful show. Um, Powerpuff Girls was yep. the same way. Um, I'm sure you you know you can go down the yeah you can go down the list and pick out the shows and go yeah it had a good theme yep uh, it helps it's a big help beautiful um, Blu-ray Lu-ray wants to know what was it like <laughs> working on Kitty Bobo it's one of my favorite shorts from the cart from Cartoon Network and I'd love to hear anything regarding its production if possible any info uh, uh, as info on this one is scarce do you remember anything from that one. I wonder if that's the guy who who created the short himself under, <laughs> under that assumed name going like, say something good. I don't have a lot. You know what? 
Kitty Boa had an interesting style look to it. Uh, I don't remember much about it because it was like a one-off uh, cartoon that was done at Cartoon Network, B supposedly being a potential for a pilot, but it never went anywhere. And um, I can't I, I can't remember the name of the guy who who was the creator of it, but it was you know it was just another job. It was a yeah. lot of times what happened at what would happen for me at Cartoon Network. I might have been working on, let's say, I'm working on Powerpuff at the time. I don't remember what show I was on, but the, the, the department that produce or makes the pilots would ask me uh, and, uh, and other people, they would say, hey, we have a pilots coming up. Do you want to do it? You know? And I would always say yes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes they turned out to be really interesting. And sometimes it was just, you know, it's just another pilot. Yeah. I don't have any, I really don't have any memory. I, I can see one kind of visual of it in my head, but that's it. I can't even, I don't remember what the story's about. And that's the problem I have with a lot of stuff because I've worked on so many things over the past 53 years. It's hard to remember every little thing. Yeah, that's like trying to sit here and remember everything you've done since high school. I mean, it just, it doesn't make any sense. But nonetheless, man, we tried. Yeah, um, sorry. <laughs> no worries at all. Um, we kind of touched touched on this a little bit with the uh, Powerpuff Girls um, revival, but uh, Torch underscore N underscore Beck wants to know, you were one of the few people to return to the Powerpuff Girls in 2016 from you know the original cast and crew. And I know it's notorious for its animation errors. Um, what was Sunman like compared to Rough Draft Korea on the original? Did you have uh, more trouble getting scenes to look how you wanted? Well, I didn't have to worry about it. First off, I would say one other thing that Randy Myers also worked on on the revival stuff with me. And he also was one of the original guys that worked on Parapuff. He was good friend. He had gone to Cal Arts with Gendy. And when his feature career kind of was dwindling down because it was features were slowly dying, yeah. Gendy hired him at Cartoon Network. Um, Sun Min, I don't think did a, as good a job as Rough Draft. And I think when Powerpuff was done, the original Powerpuff and Rough Draft, it was a far better looking show, but it was also because the show itself looked better then. It was better design, better art direction. And you also had Gendy supervising producer on Powerpuff. Mm -hmm. So Gendy could call retakes and make changes and somehow get Rough Draft to do what he wanted them to do and get it done properly. I understand that Nick Jennings, who was the ex executive producer on the revival stuff, had a lot of issues with Sun Min. And uh, I, you know, that was something I never had to deal with because I wasn't, uh, it, I was basically a, a gun for hire, like on freelance purpose on, on that show. Okay. And uh, originally I would, they would bring retakes for me to do until they finally hired an in-house director. Then I never had to do any retakes. So for me, it was like go in on a Monday, or whatever day of the week it was, pick up my my section of the show, which was probably half of the show, and Randy would pick the other, get the other half, mm -hmm. and uh, take it home and work with that on at night or on weekends, and turn it turn it back in on the following Monday. So yeah. I never I never had to deal with the problems of or issues with Sun Men. Got it. Um, app underscore RJ. He's got a question, but it starts off with uh, with a praise here. Robert's worked on a ton of shows that are very different from each other. So I was wondering if it's a challenge to adjust your style of timing when working on different shows. And he said he would also love it if you could explain the slugging process in timing animation. Okay, I'll explain the, the first, the second part first. Uh, slugging. Slugging started out um, way back when, where it was a, before the digital world, um, we, when you were directing, you would first slug the board. And what that means is the, the show, the storyboard's done and the show's been recorded and you would get an assembled track. And when they would assemble the track, sometimes it, you might get like three or four sentences in a row that were a good take. Mm -hmm. But then the next group of sentence, the next line was different take, like take three. So you'd have to cut that in. So you don't butt up the track because then it would be, the show would be ridiculous that way. So they would put in what was called a normal pause. And at Hanna-Barbera, the normal pause was, they called it an eight frame normal pause, meaning that's 
theoretically there was eight frames between that first line and this next line, but it could be sometimes only two or four or six. You just assumed it was eight. So when you were slugging the board, if you opened the track between those lines of dialogue, let's say you decide you're putting an action of like two feet, eight frames, mm -hmm. then there's now that first line is here, two feet, eight frames of slug, which is just blank mag track or not mag track, it, it's actually blank. Uh, it was a 35 millimeter film mm -hmm. and it didn't matter what the film was. And then the next piece of track. And when you slug the board, the way it used to be done and the way I did it was you timed out your action on the board, which is basically breaking down all the action, how a character moves, when it moves, according to certain parts of the dialogue, how many frames it takes to do whatever the action is, walking, running, whatever it is. And that was called slugging the board. And then that was take, they would go to, to, to the uh, editing room where they would uh, then read the sheets based on your slug board. So if you, whatever, if there was like a, a, a two feet, eight frame section or slug between these lines of dialogue, that becomes blank on the exposure sheets. Mm -hmm. And you have your line of dialogue reading top to bottom, and then it'd be that two feet, eight frames, then it'd be the next line of dialogue and so on until the end of the board. And the job of slugging the board of being a director in those days meant you were bringing the show to a certain length, which means you just couldn't make it as long as you wanted. Because yeah. if the show format was seven minutes, then you knew that you had um, seven, nine, six hundred, uh, seven, zero, six, five hundred and forty feet, you know, something like that. You, you had X amount of footage. Mm -hmm. You couldn't go over it. You had a little, you maybe a little bit. So. If it was too long, you would suggest cuts or you would, well, let's say it was a half hour show um, and it was way long, you would just kick it back to the producer of the show and say, you're X amount of feet over length, cut stuff out. And that means they would have to cut dialogue because yeah. you, you can't just cut slug. And um, that was slugging the board. And what was the first question, part of the question? Uh, the first question was, <clears throat> Oh yeah, tiny. There's so many shows. Uh, yeah. Was it hard switching styles from show to show to show? Not really. If it's a cartoony comedy stuff, it's pretty much the same. The characters are different, but you know the way they, the way you figure it out is pretty much the same. If it's an action, like if it's an action adventure, like I did some work on the, a lot of work on the very first season of the very first Batman show series that Warner Bros. did. Yeah, well, you you don't have a lot of unless they're fighting quick stuff because like characters they're live action type characters, so they, they don't move as quick. So yeah, you adjust accordingly, but it's not that hard. Once you've done enough of it, it's pretty rare that you're ever gonna come across something on a storyboard that you've never seen before. And, uh, and there's always a solution. It may take you a while to figure it out, but there's always an answer. So I don't find it all that hard, especially nowadays. Um, I, to me, it's, 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 I've been doing it for so long, it's not, I don't find it, difficult at all nature for you um so i'm gonna butcher this name aloyas underscore chinigan i'm assuming uh what are the stages of animation that you would see during production and how much would your input shape the final cut i'm assuming this is more of a director question well nowadays i don't have any input on, on the final cut all i'm seeing nowadays is i get a storyboard and uh well uh, for close enough it's all uh, I'll pull it over here so you can see it. This is my Cintiq. Okay. And I'm using a Cintiq for the Close Enough show. And they put in the Dropbox, the storyboard, the animatic, and the blank sheets with the track that's on it. So mm -hmm. I'm doing it all digitally. And that all I do is uh, write the sheets on Close Enough. And then I tell them when it's done. And I'll have to handle down the road retakes and, and pick up lines. Pick up lines are when they... Uh, in the show, sometimes they record stuff with scratch track, which is not the, the real actor because they've changed something after that was recorded and they decide they want to change the line. So that's scratch track. So I'll deal with that. I don't really influence the show at all other than what I do. I don't come in after the fact and look at the stuff uh, in post-production. Uh, I don't have to do that. And pretty much it's been that way from my earliest times of, of, of directing work where I, when I first started doing directorial type stuff in the 1980s, it was just part of the job and I was still animating in those days. And uh, once I did my thing, it was 
the last time I was going to see it. Okay. Um, Painted Dragonus wants to know, I would like to know <laughs> if you know anything about the scrapped movies and TV series Hanna-Barbera didn't get a, uh, get around to in the 80s and 90s. I have no idea what, what they're talking about in this one. Do you? Well, I, no, I don't have any idea what they're talking about either, other than I would say that Hanna-Barbera was constantly trying to come up with stuff and uh, it would probably be different once Turner owned the company. But prior to that, they were always coming up with pitches for TV shows, not so much features, but TV shows. And they don't, they don't always sell. Yeah. And in the early days, like in the in the 60s and probably into the 70s, Joe Barbera was the guy that would go to the networks all the time back in New York and he would pitch concepts to them. And then that's how shows got sold and they would make. Uh, but uh, there's probably a whole slew of things that Hanna-Barbera came up with for TV that never, never got made. And it might have even been some features. Never got made. And, but that's true of, of a lot of studios. Nowadays, it's it's really different because of the way things are done, uh, there's committees on figuring out what's gonna happen next, but uh, people come in with a, uh, either you're in-house or you're coming in and pitching a concept and if they like it, it might give you some money to develop it further. They wanna see a lot of stuff. They wanna have a lot of information, characters and all that stuff. And if you, you might even do a pilot, but even after a pilot's done, it doesn't necessarily guarantee it's gonna be on, it, ever get into a series. So it's, and it, it's it's not the same now as it was like when I started at all. It's it's really a different, completely different. Got you. Um, Xavier here wants to know. Well, actually, he's got a little bit to say before he wants to know. Uh, you worked on some of the most prestigious cartoons from the early two thousands to now. Um, when you look at how animation looked uh, looked back then compared to now, which do you prefer? When I watch Hong Kong Fooey, I can see <laughs> and feel the artistry. But modern cartoons feel, they feel more clean and less rough. Here's another thing you have to understand too. Hong Kong Fui, which I'm not quite sure, it was in the 60s, I think. Yeah. And Hong Kong Fui at that time still had a lot of vintage golden age animators still working in the industry. And those guys are all, all gone now. And, uh, and the process of uh, the way the shows were done is completely different back then as opposed to today. So you don't have any of those people around anymore. Uh, and, and when Hong Kong Fu was done, it was the old traditional system. It was like that probably, that was a scripted show mm -hmm. and traditional storyboards and same way they would record everything else. And the shows all got laid out and animated. And I think Hong Kong Fu was done here. I don't know if that was done uh, out of the country, but I think it was done at Hanna-Barbera. Yeah. So it's completely different. Nowadays, the, the process is different. We don't really animate television stuff here for the most part. It's usually sent to another country, mostly in Korea. Yeah. And um, the styles are different. You know, it's like uh, it's generations away from what Hong Kong Fui was being done. And you have people now that are, are doing stuff that, that it's not even the same. It's, it's different now from what we were doing in the early 2000s. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the stuff now has a similar look to it, which I find kind of boring. Yeah. And uh, it, and what happens too is if a show is popular, it kind of influences other people to to basically mimic that and come up with their own concept. If you look at this, just the design and look of shows, a lot of them look the same today. And it's just because that's what's popular. But I think what we were doing like at Cartoon Network in the early 2000s, you don't see that anymore. I, I, I prefer that look over to what's being done today, but I'm not in charge and I don't get to make those calls. I am in the same boat. I've said it a couple of times on here. Everything looks like the, it's cookie cutter. I mean, with the, yeah. I told you briefly uh, when we started it and when he came up, how important two people specifically are. Gendy, you've already heard how, how, how important he was as a kid and then as I've gotten older. But another one, and he got me back into animation. I think we've had this talk briefly, but J.G. Quintel, yeah. the regular show. This man is responsible for me and my son being connected. So when, when my son was born, um, two months after he was born, I deployed for, I think it was nine months, right? I come back home and he's almost a year old. He's walking. He's talking to an extent as most, you know, almost one-year-olds do. They need to say words here and there. Um, but I missed everything, right? 
And then we go to San Diego and I deploy again, come home. He's almost two. Go, uh, go to a different place. I get stationed in Jacksonville, deploy again, come home. And then he's three, four years old, right? Then we get up to Norfolk. And then when you're in the Navy, you have sea duty and shore duty. Most of the time, your first four years are at sea. And then the next four years you have shore. And then that whittles down where you have three years at sea, four years at shore, three years at sea, three years at shore, until you finish your 20 year career when you can retire and everything like that. Um, and it was so hard leaving him because like I told you earlier, I didn't have a dad. So I did not know what it was like to be a dad or how to be a dad. My mom taught me how to shave when I was like 15, my little three billy goat hairs that I had on my chin, my mom taught me how to shave. My mom taught me how to talk to girls. My mom told me how to be a man and she was not a man. She was doing two jobs like a lot of mothers have to do because you know, you got deadbeat mothers and you got deadbeat fathers. I, I was lucky and I had an awesome mom and a deadbeat father. Um, so it was very difficult for me to try to talk to him because when I would go away, mom was the center of his attention because mom was there. Mom had to do, and not my mom, his mom, my wife, Katie, she had to do everything because I wasn't there because I was in a different country fighting in some war and I wasn't boots on the ground. So I was on a ship and stuff like that. I wasn't getting shot in that. Um, but you know, I was over there doing something to support my family. And when I would come home, I would try to find whatever he was interested in. And then that's how we would connect. And this is why I owe JG so much more than just how great the regular show was. Because when I came home, we were flipping through the channels. And like I said, we're in Norfolk at this time. And the regular show was on. I was completely gone from cartoons. I hadn't watched a cartoon since 2008, 2009. And if it was cartoons I was watching when I would deploy, it was shows that I grew up with. Like Samurai Jack, like Edit and Eddie, like Dexter's Life. All these shows that I grew up with. I took those with me when I would deploy because it gave me peace of mind. It, it got me a chance to get out of my head and missing my wife and missing my kid. And when I get home, we're flipping through cartoons. And then he's like, dad, 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 stop, 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 stop. He's like, watch this. And it's the regular show. I think it was the first episode or second episode, but it's essentially, um, you know, Rigby and Mordecai doing, whoa, and then hand boning. Hand boning will save your life one day, right? And then they sit there and they do that thing. And then my kid just jumps off the couch and he's doing that, right? I'm like, what are you doing? I was like, what is this? And he's like, it's the regular show. It's funny. So I'm sitting here watching it and they throw their hands up and they go, whoa. And then my son would see this and he would do it. And this is how we would greet each other for like the first two or three months when I got off of, when I got off of deployment, I got to Norfolk, right? He would see me and we, uh, he would always know like roughly when I would get home because, you know, kids just learn, you know, um, uh, what it was it called? Like um, schedules and shit like that. So he would know when the sun started getting lower that it was almost time for dad to get home. So we had this storm door and the door would always be open and he would see me and he had his little sippy cup or his little cup and shit. And he's sitting there as like most kids do, just running around with a t-shirt on and, you know, underwear and stuff. And he would see me and he would point and he would throw his little arm up and he would go, whoa. And my wife absolutely fucking hated this. It was annoying to, yeah. to hear this shit, right? So I would see him and I would point and I would throw my hand up and I'd go, whoa. And I'd go the entire way up to the house just doing this. All the neighbors thought I was fucking crazy. They're looking at me like, what the fuck is wrong with this dude? And he's just like shaking their head and stuff. Guys out here yelling. And then uh, <laughs> there'd be a few times where I'd have stuff in my hands and I couldn't do it until I got in the house. And it would piss him off because that was our acknowledgement. That was like our high five or our bones or our hug type of thing for the longest time because we were still trying to get used to being around each other because I would gone for nine, 10 months at a time. So there was one time where I would do it and I, I couldn't get to it because I had so much stuff in my hands. And he's just running around in the house with his hands up. Whoa, 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 right? And then my wife was like, would you put that stuff down, throw your hands up and say, whoa. So he'll stop saying, whoa, right? So <laughs> with that show, that show not only got me back into animation, like I said, but that show got me to be able to talk to my kid again. And for that, man, I'll forever be grateful. Like I said, this show is more about you guys than it is about me. But I like throwing little stories in here because stuff like that, you don't get back. I can't get back the time that I miss with my son. I'll never get that time back ever, ever, ever. I'm working on it. I'm hoping, you know, Marty McFly and Dr. Emmett Brown will come back and we'll figure out some way to go back in time. But until that happens, all I've got is these memories and these memories that were built over cartoons that I watched and, and, and got to experience with my son. Um, so not only thank you for that, but, you know, thank JG for that as well. Um, getting back to the fans questions here. 
Um, U- Ulysses Bob wants to know, what did you think of Samurai Jack's award-winning classic Birth of Evil two-parter from 2003? Uh, that's what got me my first award, yes. my first Emmy, because I, I directed one part of it and uh, I thought it was great because I won, I won an Emmy for it. Uh, it's one of my favorite Samurai Jack episodes. I also like, probably my other favorite Samurai Jack is the one where the Aku hires those uh, bounty hunters from that other planet to come down and hunt down Sam, uh, hunt down Jack, and I think that turned out really good. So I like the uh, birth of a coup because I, I got an Emmy out of it. So that's great. <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story about that that episode. There was a one panel on the storyboard, and I can probably draw it for you while I'm telling you. There was a, was a panel on the storyboard that was uh, had hills and some trees. And um, this is really rough, but see the see those yeah. little marks and stuff. Yeah. So um, I'm doing this, and I I go to Kenny, go, what is that? And he goes, oh, those are guys on horses coming over the hill. Mm-hmm. And I'm going, what? I mean, you know, if I hadn't asked that question, I would have never known. And that board was done by Don Shank, who now works at Pixar. He's actually a very good board artist, but he was just probably behind schedule, and he just you know at that moment trashing it out. But yeah. Uh, th- that's one particular memory of that episode and uh, the other is you know that night when we were at the uh, sh- the shrine auditorium and we won for the show so I have fond memories of that particular episode beautiful um, one of my favorite episodes of Samurai Jack is when Aku is noticing all I think it's the 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 season finale of the first season but he's uh noticing all these kids are wanting to be samurai jack and they don't no longer want to be aku and he's telling all these these fables and he's putting aku or aku's putting himself as the hero and jack is yeah the, so it's yeah. one of my favorite episodes um tillman gaming wants to know um when if ever will we see a kids next door in space uh well that's tom warburton's show Mm-hmm. And Kids Next Door was interesting. I did a lot of freelance on that show, but it was produced out of New York, out of, out of a studio in New York. And, and Tom had been out here prior to that doing some pilots. And he, he did the, obviously the pilot for that. And I, I just freelanced and they would send me the work. Uh, I have a feeling that's another one of those things. It's now being, the old episodes are being rerun on, on Boomerang, but I, that's probably another thing that, you know, you'll never see another uh, any more of those uh and if anyone knows the answer to that it would be tom and uh i suspect that it, that's uh that's like kicking a dead horse it's not gonna happen all right this uh we've got just a few more and then we'll we're done um exo suit one wants to know and he, he wanted to start it with forgive my ignorance on this one um so he said uh but I kind of thought it was, he said, forgive my ignorance, but I kind of thought it was the creator's job to oversee. And he, go, and he goes and he's like, look, like, okay, this is the direction. I want this to go on here. Um, is there ever much conflict between creator's visions and art direction? I guess what he means by that is he didn't know that uh, the people that created it didn't direct it. So he didn't know about delegation and all this other stuff. So could you just explain a little bit, like just briefly about what that is and how, how it goes into play? Well, for most for most shows, uh, that's true. Uh, a lot of times creators of shows, Gindy being the exception, uh, they, they're not necessarily directors, but they have a vision. Uh, and so th- they'll, they'll know what they want or, they, or sometimes they don't know what they want until they see it. Uh, they, they want it to have a certain art direction so they they they'll pick their art directors and and they'll go through a process of picking out the art direction of the show directorially they'll uh, if, if they if you didn't work on the pilot and you have the pilot then they obviously want it to be uh similar to that they want it to move that way and uh the showrunners or usually the creators of the show mm-hmm have certain ideas of what they want and what they don't want yeah. and my job and anyone that does what i do there's there to give them what they want mm-hmm. you're not there to do what you want and uh and do something different from their vision because that, that won't last because you'll be out of the job fairly soon so uh, 
a lot of here's another thing too. A lot of young people today that are that are doing shows, they, they they'll create a show, they, they'll do a pilot, and it gets greenlit, and they're doing a series. They've never animated. They may have animated some stuff in school, but that's not like really doing production animation. Mm -hmm. So they don't really have that knowledge of, of how you know timing and all that stuff. So they have to rely on the fact that somebody, a supervising director or a group of people that do what I do, know what the hell they should be doing. Yeah. And they have to delegate. They delegate a lot of stuff. You know, they can't do everything themselves because when it comes to making a, a TV show, there's so many. An average crew is probably somewhere around 40 people. Mm -hmm. And you know, you have designers that model designers, BG key designers, an art director, uh, people like myself. Uh, you know, uh, all kind, you know, all kinds of people, and so they have to delegate out. And for novice people, it's probably a little bit tougher. Sometimes they get assigned a a veteran who might help them <clears throat> and um, steer them in the right direction for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's basically that's how it works today. Uh, hopefully, that answers his question. Well, I, I think it does. Um... Carpe underscore DMT wants to know. I love that. I love that name. Um, was the animation direction on Scooby Doo crossover episode with Johnny Bravo difficult or a lot of work? First off, I don't know if I even worked on that. If I did, I don't remember it. Okay. <laughs> and I would say that it's no, it would have been just like anything else. Mm -hmm. um, I've worked on a number of Scooby Doo things. I've even animated on some Scooby Doo stuff way back when at HB. Uh, I've never cared for Scooby-Doo, especially when they had come to drawing it because that those characters are always found difficult. And uh, especially that little Scrappy-Doo. Yeah. Which I thought was a, a big pain in the ass. Uh, so the crossover, I don't know what that was. I, I don't think I worked on that because I don't have any memory of that whatsoever, but it was like anything else. And, and I don't know if Van Partible was involved with that or if this was way after Van Part. There was a time when Van Parable was not connected to the show because, and it's a long story, but he was kind of, he was on the outs. Yeah. And then he came back in later on. So I don't know when that particular one was done, but I don't imagine it was any, any different than working on anything else. It's like I said before, a good director can direct anything. A bad director can't direct traffic. Um, so we already answered that one. Uh... What I what uh, what advice would you give? Um, man, some of the, some of this writing is a little hard to get through. What advice do you have in coming up with ideas for animated series in this day and age? Well, that's a good one. Uh, I don't know. You, I would say first off, don't don't copy somebody else because yeah. uh, chances are, like if you uh, if you you know, networks want to see a, a successful thing, mm -hmm. like when. Uh, SpongeBob became a big, powerful, successful show. Other studios were looking for the next SpongeBob, but they weren't looking for something that looked exactly like it because they knew that that wouldn't work. <clears throat> so I would say, you know, obviously don't rip somebody off because you'll you'll be found out rather quickly. Yeah. S study what's been going on. Uh, look into the past. Don't look into just what was done last year. Mm -hmm. But look over the entire, you know, look at a lot of stuff that's been done in television. And um, if you're, you know, if you're good at what you're doing, uh, you might get lucky. The, the hardest part is selling the concept. Yeah. And a lot of times I work on pilots and I, I'm not, the fun, the, this thought comes in my head. Wow. If they, if they put this into a pilot, I would love to see what they've rejected. Because sometimes you work on something, you go, this is terrible. But then I'll tell you something. I worked on the very first five Ninja Turtles shows mm -hmm. back in the 80s. And I didn't know anything about the Ninja Turtles. And they weren't obviously as popular as they are now. Yeah. And when I worked on those, I thought that was the dumbest thing ever. I remember <laughs> getting the, you know, I was just doing, you know, sequence slugging on this or was directing. And I thought, this is stupid. Who's, this is the dumbest thing ever, you know? And look what happened. It's it became a giant successful smash hit, yeah, exactly, and um, and they're still being made. It's like Scooby Doo. It's like they're like vampires. You can't kill them. They're, they're here for forever. And so I always tell people now, like I'm probably the worst person to ask about what's what's good and what's not because 
uh, if I think it's terrible, most likely it would be a, a big smash hit. Well, I'll take it one step further. I got a few of them over here on my arm as well. So I've got a couple of them. I'm, I'm a huge Ninja Turtles fan. <laughs> I got contacted from some people, I forgot their names, through LinkedIn asking mm -hmm. me because they, they saw that I worked on the first five. Yeah. And I did a phone interview with them. And they kept asking me all kinds of questions about Ninja Turtles and Ninja Turtles. And I said, look, I don't have any big memories about it. I can tell you what, you know, Fred Wolf Studio was like yeah. and picking up the work. And it was oh, probably only a couple of weeks work. I don't remember how long I worked on it. And it was like just another show. Yeah. And I didn't think it was, I thought it was stupid. But there, there are a tremendous amount of fans out there on Ninja Turtles. And to me, I kind of look at the turtles the same as, as no offense to your tattoos, but I look at them as the same as Scooby-Doo. I don't, I don't have any fond memories of them and I don't really care about them. I've got a, after, we've already been talking for two hours. We've only got two more left. And then I, I want to tell you a, a Scooby-Doo story, but I'm not going to do it on air because my wife will kill me if I tell her, if I tell that story. Um, so uh, Wormist17 wants to know, what was it like working on the Powerpuff Girls movie? Uh, that was, well, to me, it was, no, it was like anything else uh, at the time. They had a lot of people at the studio. They even, they even had one of the conference rooms. They stuffed a bunch of desks in one of the conference rooms just to accommodate the, the larger staff. Gendy was slugging all that that entire film, and the network went to Gendy and and asked him, please, please work on the on the because they wanted him to be like the supervising director of it. And obviously, he couldn't. He was I think we we're doing Samurai Jack at the same time. And he, uh, so I got to work, I just wrote sheets on that based on his slug. And uh, it was like anything else. It was like, for me, it was like working on the, sh the, the original show or, or anything else I've worked on because it was no different. The process was basically the same. It was okay. You know, I, I always liked working on Powerpuff. Uh, I still, uh, well, except for the, the, the more recent ones, I think, that, the only good thing about the recent uh, revival of Powerpuff was that they kept Mojo in it. Yes. And I think, Mo to me, Mojo is the best character in, in the entire series. Better than the girls, better than any of the other villains. And I think he's the funniest, the funniest character. Oh, oh. But w working on the feature was fine. It, was, it wasn't hard. It was pretty easy. I don't know if you remember the character, but Fuzzy Lumpkins was always my, uh, my favorite villain in Powerpuff Girls. Um, uh, Tron Travol underscore Travolta wants to know, um, how do you think the relationship between HBO Max and Cartoon Network is going to play out now that HBO Max is becoming the place for more action-oriented cartoons? Have no idea. Uh, you're asking the wrong guy. I can only tell you that now that, uh, you know, we're under, basically Warner Brothers is calling the shots. Warner Brothers is, is in charge of, there's two guys that are run Warner Brothers Animation and they also are in charge of Cartoon Network. The, but the decision to put things on HBO Max is coming from higher up the, from past them. They don't get to decide that stuff. I have no idea how that's going to work out. But I was, I told you this before, I was recently talking to Gindy mm -hmm. and uh, he said, and I agree with him, but networks are pretty much dying out and it's all streaming. Mm -hmm. So um, if it's successful at all, it's because they get viewers yep. and how that's going to work out, I have no idea. I mean, I, 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 I hope everything turns out to be successful for them because uh, I'd like to keep, continue to keep working for a while longer. Once I'm retired, I don't really care. <laughs> Beautiful. And this is the last one from Moving Hold. Um, for Thief and Cobbler, I don't know what this is. I'm hoping you will. I, I already know the answer. Go ahead. Okay. I don't even know the. What's that? Go ahead. I know there's going to be a question about it, but I got, it's a funny answer. Okay. For Thief and Cobbler, were you part of Richard Williams' team or brought in by the studio after he was excused from the project? Okay. Here's something that, that everyone should know. Okay. IMDB is not 100% accurate. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you will find things on your IMDB that you never had anything to do with. That's one of them for me. And, yet, and sometimes there'll be lots of stuff that you know you should have up there and it never shows up. Thief and the Cobbler that, that, that they're referencing, it probably somehow, I don't know how I got connected that. Uh, I never had anything to do with it, never worked on it. But Fred Calvert, the guy that I, gave me my first job, he took over the project of Thief and the Cobbler because he was connected to the, to the uh, insurance company that took away the, the thing from, 
from uh, Richard Williams. And he did that in North Hollywood. I had zero to do with that film and I have no idea how it shows up on my IMDb. And trying to get IMDb to fix or change things is uh, kind of a nightmare. Yeah, I, I, I can I've, imagine. I've tried, I, I recently got them to add one thing on that's not about a show, but it, my, my golden award and I, I could only get it on as a trivia thing. And so, but getting them to put on a credit, it's, 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 it's incredibly hard. You would think that, that, that the only reason people go to that site is to figure out what their favorite people have done. And you would think that they would, oh man, let me just listen to the person that did all of this shit. If I don't do it, why would I have it on? It's just, they're a great resource, but just like Wikipedia, they're never a hundred percent right. So hopefully yeah. they'll, they'll lighten up some. And then he had one more part and we touched briefly on it. Um, but he said specifically for Samurai Jack, how do you achieve those long still moments that were still so packed with tension? Somehow we linger 10 seconds on Jack standing completely still. And instead of being bored, I'd be on the edge of my seat. Um, do you just chalk that up to amazing writing and animation? Or, you know, what would you say is the key behind that, that, that tension, I guess? That's Gendy. Gendy. Because what happens is in something like that, uh, you may because we were doing slugging the boards in those days. And if it was a show that I directed, I may have put down like, a, let's say a five foot hold, which is only like a little over two seconds long. Mm -hmm. But he would maybe come back because he would check your boards to see the direction. And he would change things or add stuff to it. So Gindy's the guy that's responsible for those long holes because he, he, would, he would tell you sometimes, <clears throat> I, wanna, I want to, let's say, I, a 10 foot hold on this this scene and that's to build up the tension yeah so it's all it's all gindy okay um and that that's oh, oh oh no i got one more i'm sorry um this is actually from my brother-in-law he's super nerdy when it comes to jack he knows more stuff about this thing than i could ever try to remember um and this may or may not be a question you can't answer. And he said, what inspiration did you use to visually represent the psychological break Jack experiences upon realizing he had killed a human? <laughs> I have no idea. I would just say it's, it, that's the way this, the, the show was boarded out. You just do what's in front of you. Okay. Uh, I, had, I had no part in writing on, Jack was also done the same way that Dexter's and Powerpuff were done in this respect that they would have story meetings. They weren't scripted. They would come up with an outline and the board artists would then have to flush out that outline and do you know, the, the, the board and throw in additional dialogue whenever there was any. So I had nothing to do with, with uh, those psychological moments other than the fact that if it was a show that I was working on, it was just something I would have to figure out the timing for, but it was not up to me. Beautiful, man. Um, well, like I said, uh, it's been fantastic. I know you said you were working on a couple things. Um, you're working on a couple things and I don't know what happened to my little list I had. Um, but what are those things that you're working on that we could push some traffic towards when they start happening and everybody can start watching? Well, well, JG show close enough, which is, I'm now working on the third season and they've already, I think they've already had, have already, uh, shown the first season on it's on hbo max now yes and i think what's running now is or what's available there is the second season i'm not sure yeah both and seasons. i'm working yeah i'm working on the third season now and uh working on that and i'm also working on a spin-off of we bear bears which is uh, the spin-off is we baby bears which is the same characters except they're, they're little bears and yeah. so they're kids and the difference now is that they go through uh, different adventures because they have this magical box that can take them anywhere so they you know they go from place to place they're basically looking for a home but it each place turns out to be problematic and it always has a happy ending so i'm working on those two things beautiful man um is there anything else that we didn't cover i mean we went pretty long i mean with about two hours and 10 minutes is what we recorded for man i hope you had fun uh is there anything else that you'd like to tell the fans or where can the fans come and find you if they want to say hey robert i liked what you did well, first off, I have that Facebook page that you've, you've seen. Right. And uh, so they're welcome to, uh, I I'm s somewhat skeptical of some people that when I get friend requests, because if they don't show me something that looks like they have an interest in animation, I tend to not uh, accept them. And I've been getting some requests that are obviously have no 
interest in animation. And they're, they're usually young, attractive females, and they'll send you they'll send you like one or two photos, and they're low cut. And uh, I even had one that was really kind of funny because she, she was I don't know where she looked like she was in a mall somewhere, but you couldn't see anybody around her, and she had her pants pulled down, and you could see her thong. Yeah. And I'm going, yeah, sure, yeah. This is somebody that's because I, I had to learn the hard way that my daughters pointed out. All oh, those people are just looking for sugar daddies. Oh, yeah. So uh, it, I would tell people if they're interested in looking at animation art, they can, they can um, send me a friend request. And then if they have some question about some show that I've worked on and they wanna know, you know I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer it to the best of my ability. Uh, I obviously don't wanna give up my phone number or address or anything like that because I don't wanna be, I've already got one person that's kind of become a nuisance, yeah. but uh, yeah. Facebook is one place, and uh, I, I'm, that's about the only place I'm visible. Beautiful, man. Uh, he's been Robert. I've been Julian. This has been the What's In My Podcast, and this has been another piece of your childhood. Thank you guys so much. Bye. This podcast was presented by the Epic Sewers Podcast Network, the home of all your pop culture podcast needs. With shows like Epic Tales, Epic Tales from the Sewer, the Spoiler Force Podcast, Creator Con Q&A, comic watchers, and the What's in My Head podcast. Follow us on this journey and get down and nerdy as we bring you the best in pop culture.